uh, working on, thank you for the recording, Alice, working on this LMIS approach for uh, in DHS2. And again, welcome to everybody for participating. Um, I'll quickly go through the agenda and the different points that we'll be discussing throughout this full week academy. Thank you for taking the time for taking part, but I'll go through each section and you'll know what it is we'll be presenting and what we'll be sharing at each point. And then I'll hand the word to some of my colleagues who would also introduce themselves and present some more content. So quickly, here is the agenda. Just to confirm that you can all see my screen. Yes, we can. Thank you, Alice. So for day one today, we'll be start. We'll start with again reviewing this agenda here now and going through some uh, uh, general housekeeping and, and how we'll be managing uh, the academy throughout the week. We'll then hand over to Mike Frost, who will be giving opening remarks, and I'll allow Mike to introduce himself at that time as well. And then followed by Gasim, who will introduce some uh, community related uh, content. And at the end of this session, we'll then uh, have a group picture where we'll all turn on our cameras and we'll take a picture to be posted and shared. Um, Mike will be particularly talking about the approach that we've had with DHS2 LMIS and how we fit into the broader picture, the uh, information management picture within a, uh, a national system. Immediately after, I'll go into the specific uh, LMIS uh, um, vision and uh, methodology that we've developed and how that works how it uh, should be used and perhaps uh, uh, not be used, some of the guiding uh, factors. After that, we'll have a short break at 11.30 to 11.45, at which point we'll start a session on DHS2 and integration. A large part of what we'll be presenting and what we're showing here is related to integration, uh, connecting last mile logistics to a central system. So our deputy tech lead, uh, Austin McGee, will be presenting that. We'll then have another short break and then we'll have Pear Kronzler from the Medexa CLMIS presenting both their software, uh, their ELMIS system, and an integration use case with DHS2 in Mali. At the end of the day, we can have a short Q&A. And I remind everybody also to use the Slack channel, and Alice will go through this to uh, come with questions throughout the presentations. Day two, we'll start with a recap of the points in day one through a Mentimeter. So it will be everybody participating together in a Mentimeter um, uh, uh, survey to uh, uh, review the content. We'll then have George McGuire, who works closely with me on LMIS. He's the LMIS technical advisor going through stock reporting and transaction-based stock management using DHS2. This will be very much a, a hands-on demo where he'll be uh, demoing and showing the system live. There won't be so much PowerPoint slides, actually uh, uh, very, very few. And, and then after the break, we'll go through a demo configuration where he'll actually go through and show how this can be done and how you can do this. We'll also have an open Q&A if you have any questions. At the end of that day, we'll also have a, a presentation from M Supply, uh, who will be presenting their system uh, and some of the integration cases we've had. And then ending the day two with an expert lounge. So we'll have a full hour and perhaps even a bit more time where we can take your questions and answers. You can connect with each other and with us. We can have breakout rooms. And this is really just a, a prolonged session where we can discuss uh, specific questions and use cases. All right. So day two will be stock day. Any comment, Alice, or is that fine? No, please yeah. go ahead. Fine. Yeah. Day three, we'll do again, start with a recap and then go into biomedical equipment, lifecycle management, also cold chain equipment, inventory management, both demo and uh, configuration. And in the afternoon, and then later having a temperature management uh, um, using uh, Blue Maestro temperature monitors. And at the end of that day, we'll have Belida ELMIS and presenting their ELMIS system, again, followed by a Q&A to finish the day. Day four, um, again, starting with a recap and then going into GS1 data matrix and potential use cases. George will then present an LMIS performance management framework. So really connecting the data, the analytics, and uh, this, this approach to then decision-making, how that can improve supply chain man management and how decision-making can be influenced. And lastly, we'll have then DHS2 and analytics and some of the different analytics features and capacity within the system. And then we'll have, uh, again, end of day Q&A. We can maybe finish that and then have the break. <laughs> we don't need to have a break. Uh, before a short Q&A. And then lastly, on day five, we'll go through 
uh, different considerations for an assessment for an implementation implementation planning and then we'll have specifically a session on android so using the android capture app and how that can be used to uh, uh, leverage some of these different features uh, particularly targeting targeting uh, low resource sites at the end of the uh, of friday we'll also have a uh, longer mentimeter recap from the full week to ensure that everybody has uh, uh, gotten the different uh, uh, concepts that we've presented how you should or should not be using DHS2 to support your supply chain management and taking also any final questions or comments that you may have. So that's the agenda um, for the for the five days. Uh, I'll give the word now to Alice, who will go over some uh, practicalities. Over to you, Alice. Thank you so much, Bruno. Um, could you stop sharing your screen? Great, thank you. So now I'm going to presents Slack. So basically this is the Academy Slack workspace. Just a minute. Do you all see my screen? We see it. Okay, cool. So yes. normally yes. as participants, you all have been added to Slack. Um, if not, I've just posted in the chat, the link to join Slack. So this is the dedicated Slack workspace for the Academy. And this is the main tool to communicate with the facilitators. So if you open Slack, you will see that you have three channels, three different channels that we will be mainly using. Um, if you cannot see the channels, the only thing that you have to do is to go here to click on the plus browse channels, and then you will have all the channels that are uh, accessible. So we are, so the first channel is the announcement channel. So basically we are mostly using it to, to provide some information. Like for instance, I have posted the links to Zoom, um, the agenda, and I will be posting daily reminders here. And also as Bruno has mentioned, the, this academy is recorded and the recording will be available the same day. Uh, so once the recording is, av is available on the DHS2 YouTube channel, I will also inform you by writing a message in the announcement. So this, cha this channel is mainly used by us facilitator to provide key information. And then we have the second channel, it's the introduce yourself channel. I see how that actually many people, many participants have already started using it to introduce themselves. So if you have not, please do not hesitate to write a short message, your name, surname, organization you're working from and where you are based. And then the final channel, which is actually the super important is the questions ones. So basically this one, if you need any clarification, any more information from, from uh, facilitators related to the sessions or um, any support, do not hesitate to ask like to basically write your message on this channel. So, and we'll make sure that one of us actually reply to your question. So it's very important to use this channel if when you want to, when you need some support or you need some um, to ask any questions related to the academy, whether it's before the session starts, during the session starts, uh, during the session, sorry, or after the session, we are always available. So yeah, don't hesitate to use it. One quick note, um, it would be great if you remind, uh, if you try not to send direct messages to the facilitators. The reason for that is that when you are using the main channels, you can be sure that one of us will see the message. But for instance, if you are sending a direct message either to me or to Breno or to George, um, we basically, it, will, it may be more difficult to get a quick answer. So really, really try not to send direct messages and use only the channel, the question channel to, to reach out to us. And then the second, yeah, so I think this is it for Slack. If you need any, any, more, any more information re related to Slack, um you can you can either send it well the best way is actually to use them the chat on zoom uh, but normally as i said you are all part of L the lms slack workspace so it should be okay um but if not if you cannot join slack you can you can let me know on the chat on zoom and i will make sure that you have access to the workspace 
Um, and then the other thing you will see in the chat also that I posted a link to the Academy folder, Google Drive folder. So basically this is the main folder we'll be using to add all the resources related to the, to the Academy. For instance, if you click on the link that I shared on, uh, in the chat on Zoom, I will also actually share it on, um, on Slack. When you click on the link, you will be here like you will see basically a folder for every day. So for instance, let's take today's folder. You have one folder which called presentations. And if you click here, you will have access to, the, to today's presentation. It's already on, available on the Google Drive. So don't hesitate to click on the link that you will find on the, in the chat so that you can already download the presentation of today, right? And then you have another uh, document which is really important. It's uh, called important links. So if you click on this document, you will have two links. The first link is the attendance form. So what is the attendance form? Every day, um, the facilitators will be sharing what we call the word of the day. So basically, it's a kind of nice way we have to make sure that participants uh, attend every day sessions. So on this, on this document, you click on the link here and you will have this form. At some point during the session, the facilitator will tell you now the word of the day is and then the only thing that you will have to do once you have the, the information about what is the word of the day is to click on the link uh, on the attendance form, write your name, your email, and then the word of the day, which has been communicated by the facilitator. So this will enable us to see basically to make sure that participants are attending every day session. And then at the end of the, of the academy, it will be part of the certification process because you will have all the participants who are able to, to give us at least four words of the day out of five will get a certificate of participation. So it's really, really important when you, you attend the session that you fill in the, the attendance form with the correct words of the day. And, the, and actually one more thing, the word of the day will also be available on the recording. So it's really easy to, to, to get it. And then the second overlink is the feedback form. So every day we will be asking your feedback. So it's really to help us uh, improving the academy and making sure that the academy content is meeting your, your needs and your, your requirements. So it's really, really important. It takes literally one minute um, so uh, to, to fill it in, so it's very quick. Uh, so every day you will also have like reminders to share your, your feedback using the feedback form. So yeah, so these are basically the resources that you, can, you are able to find in the, uh, in the Academy content folder. And I think I mentioned everything. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Alice. And we'll go over then to Mike Frost, who will give some opening remarks and of course present himself and um, really situate us within this broader landscape. So over to you, Mike. Great, thanks, Breno. Um, and very good to see you all. Uh, welcome to day one of the LMIS Academy. I'm Mike Frost. I'm a senior advisor here at the University of Oslo. I'm a product manager leading the, the tracker software development team. Tracker is the part of DHS2 that handles individual and longitudinal data. And we'll be talking a bit about that throughout the week, about how that will apply to the supply chain and, and the logistics data that, uh, that we're interested in. Um, just to share really quickly, I also previously worked for eight years as a supply chain advisor, working on uh, health systems and uh, supply chain for malaria and HIV in particular. So for me, this is uh, this is a subject near and dear to my heart. So uh, yeah, happy to happy to be sharing with you all. I'm just going to give a bit of a brief uh, overview of DHS2 as a system and our own approach. Uh, to logistics and supply chain data and how that fits in with the DHS2 ecosystem. So just starting to share my slides now. Um, just 
briefly because I always think that it's important to ground ourselves um, into what what is this work that we're doing and what are we trying to accomplish. So I'm taking us back in time to uh, 1854 in London where there was a cholera outbreak. Um, and this really ended up being the, the start of epidemiology and of, of public health a bit as a discipline. And then all relied on data. And in fact, in this case, kind of geospatial data. We're looking at a map that uh, 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 John Snow created during the cholera outbreak. At the time, there was the theory that uh, cholera was being spread through the air, and John Snow didn't believe in this theory and ended up creating this map to try to find where all of the cases of cholera were and triangulated them around a central point here, the, the water pump that was on Broad Street. And from that, decided to take off the handle from the water pump and help to end this outbreak. And the, the reason I share this is to say that from the beginning, public health and the approach of, of trying to really improve the lives of, of people living with uh, different conditions, diseases, um, getting access to medicines, always has relied on data. And since this time, um, health as a field has kind of gotten hungrier and hungrier for data. And there are many, many competing demands and needs and ways to analyze this data. So I'm throwing this up here just to give an example of, of a single interaction of a child receiving a vaccine and the kind of data that is generated by that interaction with the health system and the kind of uh, analysis and decisions that are meant to be made from that piece of information. And this is to, to help us to understand why it is that uh, the DHS2 software is interested in an in integration point and linking in to logistics and having a, a shared set of data between health systems and logistics systems. But hopefully as you're taking a look at this slide, you're seeing the, the many different uh, groups that may be asking for this data that are involved with disease surveillance, that are planning future immunization campaigns, those perhaps that are responsible for following up on an adverse event following immunization. There's always groups that are responsible for the population management, managing population registers, designing catchment areas. Um, and of course, the topic that we're going to be talking about now, the use of that vaccine, the, the way that it was stored, how it traveled through the supply chain, who ended up receiving it. Um, again, if there was an adverse event, perhaps being able to follow up and recall a batch of vaccines. So there's a lot of information generated by every single health event. And it's important to have a set of tools and approaches that are going to help the people that are responsible for providing health be able to focus more on health and spend a little bit less time on the data capture and reporting of this. The problem with this, of course, is that where the clients are being seen is also the place where all the data is generated. It's also where all the data is being requested from. So many of you may be familiar with uh, looking at the health sites, the health posts, health facilities, clinics, where they have all of this data sitting, not just in the patient files that you see lining the walls here, but also the many different requested reporting forms and registers that are coming from various different parts of the, the national health programs or the national logistics system. And I'm showing you what to me is one of the best organized uh, sites that I've seen here from a picture I took in, in Zambia in 2010. Um, it really can be much more chaotic and hectic than this. And many of the, the health workers and the people that are managing the storerooms that we'll be talking about, those that are responsible for doing monthly balance and check of logistics, are all the same people when you get down to these lower levels of supply chain and the lower levels of the health system. And they have competing demands on their time where the hope and desire is that they would be able to spend the majority of their time caring for clients and being able to help the health of the population that they're serving. But they very often are spending significant portions of their day filling out reports, uh, doing aggregated uh, weekly summaries, tallying things up in registers and spending a lot of time on this information. Just wanted to give you a quick glance at what the information systems are and how they break down uh, at these different levels, what kind of responsibilities they have. So I'm, I'm borrowing this actually from some activities that the World Bank has been doing this year, trying to map out the different information systems in country and what their areas of responsibility are. 
And again, we won't dive into all of these different pieces, but what I did want to give you a quick look at was the top left corner here, where we have the HMIS, the Health Management Information System, which is covering health services, but also contains information about medicine and supplies, also contains information about who is working where in the human resources uh, concept. Um, and also the trackers level, which is covering uh, direct point of care, uh, data information at many times, providing uh, decision support, helping uh, the health workers plan out their day, and capturing information on what people are diagnosed with, what they are provided in the terms of health commodities. And you can see there's, of course, overlap with the kinds of data that are being collected and gathered in these systems with what is traditionally thought of as the LMIS, the Logistics Management Information System. So I just wanted to dive into this a bit more. We're a diverse group um, and wanted to make sure that we had the same understanding of what HMIS is and what the data are, and then talk a bit about the LMIS. So the, the basic HMIS architecture, again, this is super simplified. Um, if you go to a single country and try to map out what the information flow is for an HMIS, it's gonna be a little, more, a little more chaotic than this. But just giving you a list of the types of data being collected and where it's being generated. You can see that whether we're talking about the disease surveillance, routine services for reproductive health, ANC, uh, immunization, uh, whether we're talking about the population or the facility registry, the, the source of all of this data really is down at the facility and uh, community levels. And in fact, what the health systems are trying to reach ultimately at the bottom of this uh, chart are, of course, the clients. And this is something that we can see repeated when we're looking a bit at, uh, again, a very simplified version of a national LMIS. Again, if you were doing a, a, a better look at your national LMIS, it would look uh, like a spider web of data going back and forth between all of these sites, but just trying to break down the various levels here. And the national LMIS, where it is operating well, most often is covering the, the supply chain from the port where things have been received, traveling through the regional central warehouses, where it enters into the health sector where it's entering into the hospitals, the district warehouses, down to health post, health centers, and community health workers. But I've grayed out kind of the bottom part of the bar there that says national LMIS, because of course, this is the most difficult part for the LMIS is to capture the data that is further down in the supply chain and have clear visibility into how the commodities have been broken up between sites, who is receiving those commodities, where is their wastage, where could there be transfers. So typically the LMIS is, has a much more uh, complete set of data when it's hitting kind of the district level and above. So we, if we align these two information systems and take a look, we can see there's a very clear alignment down here towards the bottom part of the information chain, uh, particularly looking at the facilities and the community level, and of course, ultimately trying to reach the same people, whether with health services or with the health commodities, we're trying to reach the same population. At this last mile, of course, there is very rich data that can be used for the logistics system. This is where you could get actual consumption data, know who received what health commodity and based on what diagnosis at what point in time. This is where issues happen from the storeroom to the dispensary in the health facility or from the health facility to a community health worker. This is where it's most important that we have an understanding of storage and understand if they're being able to, to keep the appropriate amounts and supply, whether they're stocking out, whether they're facing expiries. Um, and it opens up opportunities of things like transfer between sites where one has overstocked and the other is understocked. So this is really uh, an area that for us uh, is, is a key focus for data capture. But there's another area, of course, at the national level where these things uh, coincide, where if you're making uh, planning for a future immunization campaign or you're trying to quantify for the malaria need, then again, equally, you're going to need that information and be able to triangulate between the health services data and the logistics data and make appropriate plans for the future, be able to respond to crises, be able to respond to stockouts. And so there's a higher point in the chain as well where DHS2 and the requirements within a logistics uh, information system uh, align. 
So now I'll take a step back um, from that kind of introduction and talk a bit about what DHIS2 is for those of you that are less familiar. So we are referring uh, to the United Nations uh, General Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, uh, where they have uh, outlined the concept of digital public goods as being something that are essential for reaching the sustainable development goals for providing the kind of support that are necessary in especially low and middle income countries to be able to get the information and make the decisions necessary for the sustainable development goals. So we, DHS2, are uh, meeting the, the goals and needs of the, this concept of a global public good. Uh, this is really coming from a three kind of tier summary uh, definition, um, and it's a definition for a public good that has been around for some time and is often applied to things like roads or water or electrical infrastructure. The, the concept being that for a a global good, it must be something that if used, if consumed, doesn't reduce the quantity. Uh, it's something you can't prevent others from using. using. It's available. Um, it's freely available more or less worldwide. Um, the Digital Public Goods Alliance has taken this definition a step further and created a standard for what would be considered a digital public good. This standard is supported by the Norwegian Agency for Development, UNDP, UNICEF, and other groups. And again, this applies to DHS2. In fact, DHS2 was one of the first uh, digital products that they chose to register in the digital public goods uh, handbook and demonstration of, of this specific standard. So a digital public good is something that is relevant to the sustainable development goal. It uses approved open licenses. Uh, DHS2 relies on the, the three clause BSD license and is freely available, can be downloaded and used by anybody. There's clear ownership. The roadmap and the software development uh, for DHS2 is managed here through the University of Oslo at the Health Information Systems Program Center. Uh, I'll talk about that more in a bit, in a, uh, bit more. Uh, it has platform independence, is properly documented. You're able to extract the data and use that data for uh, analysis. Uh, you adhere to privacy and applicable laws, uh, adhere to standards and best practices, do no harm by design, and then a further look at that ninth principle uh, for data privacy and security. Again, I won't go into all of the details of this, but wanted to outline a bit what makes DHS2 different than a lot of the other uh, information system choices that countries can make. Um, the DHS2 is not something that you need to have a specific partnership with the University of Oslo. You can download and use the software yourself. Uh, again, one of the reasons that we record these kinds of uh, videos as we're doing in Academy is to be able to share those publicly. There are many guides and tutorials available. Um, there's uh, the opportunity for, for the country themselves to own the DHS2 platform, to install it wherever they'd like to, whether locally or in the cloud, and have their own staff working for the, the various groups in the government that can manage the system over time. And that's really the goal of what DHS2 is. So just going past this quickly, showing that it's registered and listed within the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Part of what I wanted to, to show here is that this digital public good is meant to be useful the world over. And oftentimes from kind of the global donor agency's perspective, they're thinking of this going from the developed and, and wealthier parts of the world to low middle income countries. But I'm showing you a, a headline here from uh, Norway, where they, this, during the COVID crisis, they also had to turn to DHS2. And of course, most of us won't speak Norwegian, so we'll do a bit of translation here showing that actually some advancements within DHS2 that began with Sri Lanka and Uganda came the other way back to Norway and ended up being the system that was used for a half of the country's health centers when it came to the COVID contact tracing, registration, surveillance, um, and was something that uh, ended up being really important for the, the efforts of Norway to, to battle uh, the, the COVID epidemic. Um, again, for us, this is exactly what our hope is, is that this DHS2 platform is something that, that consistently benefits everyone and can continue to improve over time and be used by, by anybody that needs it. And so again, as we're looking at information needs and we're considering logistics and health, these are actually just a couple of the areas that we cover. 
We've also been asked to branch out and to cover more within the education uh, information system sector. And it's being used by many groups all over the world for various purposes, whether environmental or monitoring of workforce or internal data systems for NGOs. It's a very flexible platform with a very generic data model. So just showing you a very recent quote that came from the prime minister of Norway as uh, he was addressing the General Assembly at the UN, uh, referencing the some 70 countries that are using DHS2 as their national health information system and talking about the importance of being able to expand this to, to others. So what is DHS2 now that we've talked a little bit about kind of the values and the intentions? Uh, DHS2 is a piece of software that has grown out of a 25 or more year collaboration with uh, many partners around the world. Um, it was begun in collaboration with the University of the Western Cape in South Africa during the 90s, um, where the emphasis was on starting to just be able to collect any data at all from district levels within the health information system. Uh, since that point, it has grown into DHS2 as a platform, the online version of this software that's uh, open and available to everyone. Uh, there'll be lots of links that are shared with you about where to access materials for DHS2. It works whether it's in the web browser or on an Android client. It can be hosted locally or in the cloud, as I mentioned. And it's really designed with a focus on low and middle income countries and trying to support the needs of information capture. Um, it's used for clinical workflows, as I've mentioned, for health aggregate kind of uh, summary reporting into the HMIS, but also many other purposes, and is endorsed as a global public good. Uh, the University of Oslo has been managing the, the development of the software um, and doing two releases a year and being supported by a wide array of global donors, many of whom are also directly supporting the supply chains in the, the countries that we aim to support. Uh, many of whom have kind of uh, uh, aligned interest in reporting and collecting data that can be used for better decision making when it comes to public health. This is just to give you a snapshot of the global footprint of DHS2. More than 90 countries use the software in some capacity. There are 69 or more uh, national scale systems. Um, and it's supported by a large community. As an open source platform, uh, we conduct uh, many, many different trainings regionally and globally um, and have a, a large community that you can join. There'll be a link for this, the community of practice, cop.dhs2.org. Um, and that will be an area where you can speak to each other, help support one another, answer each other's questions when it comes to using DHS2 for logistics. Um, I'm showing you the other part of DHS2. That part was looking specifically at kind of the aggregated HMIS kind of reporting, but DHS2 equally is being used very broadly by a large number of countries for tracker, for individual level data collection. And this is an area that much of the world is able to move to. Um, that they're able to collect now data down at this facility level, down at the community health worker level, kind of client interaction or patient encounter one at a time, be able to collect that individual data, which is very powerful because you can use that data for all kinds of future analysis, even analysis that you weren't yet prepared to conduct because you had set up aggregate forms. The individual data can be disaggregated and combined in many ways. And with the logistics uh, information can be triangulated better with the health data and be able to have a deeper dive into what this information contains. So from our perspective, the, this platform is adopted so widely and used by so many because of kind of these three approaches, building on established approaches and partnerships. Many countries that already use this as a platform already have internal capacity within the Ministry of Health or within their IT departments. They have local networks and uh, private vendors that they work with that support their DHS2 system. Uh, we think that further investment in the platform in these countries strengthens them overall for everyone. So it's not just an individual investment or a vertical investment, but it actually builds out the capacity and capability of the tools over time. And that it leverages this local expertise and innovation who are often building uh, past beyond what the platform currently does when they have a specific need. And those developments can be uh, gathered back into the main platform to be shared with the world. They can be posted through an app uh, hub that we host and shared with one another.
So again, just a quick snapshot and then a look at the, the, the benefits of using DHS2 and why it ends up being a sustainable and usable solution in your countries. This is taking a look at our annual conference this year where we had more than 800 people attend coming from 118 countries with really strong support from ministries of health. Um, this event is something that we're not able to have everybody join locally anymore and fly to Norway. So it's something that's become an online event um, with more than 500 organizations uh, attending. So part of the point of sharing this information with you is to know that if you aren't already in contact with someone in your country that is using DHS2, you probably could identify them and seek to work with them. Our idea would be that you would be adding to and strengthening existing uh, capacity in the country. And so you would probably already have somebody that is hosting a version of DHS2 that is supporting it through their HMIS that is using it for various health programs. So a, a quick look here also at our regional support, and there'll be some of uh, this staff that are online. We have a network of regional partners that all have this same name, HISP, the Health Information Systems Program. Uh, we, as the University of Oslo, do not directly work with all of the 90 countries mentioned. In fact, we usually try to have uh, local uh, groups that can be the ones that are supporting and working closely with the government. Uh, you can see a list of those that are very closely associated with us. These groups also, in return, are a part of the software development process. They bring requirements back to us uh, to work on in the platform. They provide use cases. They document challenges. They report bugs. And so, again, they would be a very significant resource for you as you begin to work within DHS2 and the logistics system. There would be most likely a regional group in your area that could provide direct technical support, that could troubleshoot, that can help set up configuration, that can work with you. Uh, just to mention for the academy, which you are currently aware of because you're attending one, there is a website for all of the academies. There's also an online academy to give introductory knowledge about how to configure and set up DHS2. And there's uh, regional trainings held worldwide all the time. At this point, we've trained, I think, over 6,000 uh, users of DHS2, meaning that there's a large community that you can draw on in terms of receiving direct support. Just showing you a, a bit of the quick uh, screenshots of the, the, the website where you can download the software. Again, you don't need to ask permission to do this. This is freely available with all of the notes and supporting documentation, many different uh, guides that are available to show you whether you're an implementer, a developer, or a system admin, how to support and use the DHS2 software. And there's very specific guidance written also that's pertaining to different topic areas, uh, including information information available about how to set things up for logistics and supply chain. Uh, we also have an open roadmap so that if there are aspects of DHS2 that you are wondering if it's under development or would like to be a part of the, the offered set of functionalities, uh, you can go to dhs2.org slash roadmap and see what we're currently working on. You can break it down by different product areas and see what the analytics team is doing or the tracker team is doing. And you can join our publicly facing uh, JIRA as well, where we submit issues, we track our development, where you can report bugs and be a part of this platform and help to make it better for yourselves and for, for all of the global users. Okay, this will be kind of the final part of my overview here. I just wanted to make a mention of DHS2 packages. The University of Oslo, we are a, a collaborating center with the World Health Organization and have been for some years. Part of what we have done working with the World Health Organization is to develop the concept of a package for DHS2, which focuses on a specific need, a specific disease, a specific health area, and does a pre-configuration of the software to be able to capture all of the necessary data, to produce the right kinds of analytics, to show those visualizations appropriately, to set up the appropriate kinds of reports. Mainly, or basically just to give you a sense of what this is like, we're looking at an empty 
box uh, uh, of Lego with, with many different pieces here, this would be what you would get if you just download DHS2. You get a bunch of parts, a bunch of pieces, and you would need some specific knowledge about the domain area uh, that you're working towards and DHS2 as a tool in, in order to be able to build something functional. But the idea of having a pre-configuration of DHS2 with documentation is to give you something that is a bit more purpose-built, that has instructions, and that can help you to build something that will match kind of the vision that you have and the needs in countries. So when it comes to logistics, this means having pre-configured templates that are available that can be adapted for your country. So they would have the key data elements defined, they would have dashboards that contain the appropriate visualizations, that have recommended approaches to doing validations of data, that have guidance and materials about how to approach uh, uh, logistics as a topic, and can be then adapted over time for your needs, for the local uh, supply chain uh, configuration, for matching the health system, for matching the work processes in your country. So this is our approach. We create a global good that we share with everyone through the, the University of Oslo. We have many regional hubs and partners that we can refer you to and that can provide direct uh, local support. They most often already have a connection in your country and you can work with them. And we try to support national implementations, local ownership and sustainability in the country. So all of these three concepts we think apply very well as well to the logistics space that it's an area that has the same, uh, often the same group of data collectors, often uh, similar data requirements and data analysis needs and often providing the kind of information that is needed for the decision makers at the, the, the highest levels. A quick look at how quickly these things can roll out in an existing country. This is just to give you a look at the timeline for COVID. Uh, we saw that uh, early January 2020, uh, Sri Lanka moved very quickly to create their own version of DHS2 for COVID. COVID-19, configuring it for the needs of that country. That was well before even the WHO got around to producing the technical guidelines for COVID-19 surveillance late in uh, February. We worked with the Sri Lanka and Uganda configurations of DHS2 and put together one of these standardized configurations or packages and put that out to the community. By May, there were 27 countries that were using DHS2 as their national COVID surveillance platform. So this, of course, was leveraging the existing uh, infrastructure in the country, working with the people that already knew how to set up and maintain and establish these information systems, leveraging also the kind of global partnerships that the DHS2 community has, working with WHO, UNICEF, CDC, and other groups, and being able to channel some of the flexible funding that they received um, for improving information systems. Again, all of these we think are concepts that apply equally to the health supply chain, to logistics reporting, and being supported by many of the same groups. So with that, I think I'm going to round it out now and show a bit of what scale looks like for DHS2 so that you can have a sense whether it support your country. But we have systems at this point from using COVID that had up to 20 million plus users. At this point, this I took these numbers back in uh, December uh, of 2021. I know Nigeria at this point has over 25 million individuals registered into their system. So it, they can support very large and very transactional kinds of databases and systems that would be necessary for the many commodities that are being managed in your supply chain and the way that reporting works. We have many tools that are available for how to implement. We'll go over a lot more of this information in the week. Uh, costing packages, helping you to understand what it would take to roll this out in your country. We'll give you a lot of guidance and information about how to do the implement, implementation, what are the kinds of uh, things that you should plan for, the, the challenges that you might run into, and ways that you can work with the platform. Um, and wanted to just mention that we also, as an open platform, are very interoperable. We focus highly on this. You'll get more information uh, from uh, Austin and others about uh, extensibility and the way the platform works, but just giving you a sense that we already are collaborating with many of the tools that are in the health space and the supply chain space. Uh, you'll get a bit more information about this throughout the week as well. So this is just a, a 
quick schematic to show you the kinds of interoperability that can be achieved with DHS2. This is looking directly at the Norwegian system, which the health uh, implementers here set up themselves, connecting to many different registers, population register, the clinical record system, the immunization registry, health data registry. So it would be our goal as well, working within the LMIS space to be able to exchange data with the warehouse systems, with the, the open LMIS system that you're using with whatever ERP systems that you have, DHS2 as a platform can be uh, set up to exchange data with all of these various systems. So with that, I think I'm going to round out uh, just posting a bit of the these bullet points that are repetition. Uh, somebody has asked already for materials um, in the comments just to say that all of the slides and all of the documentation will be shared with you to be able to follow up on. And uh, we're excited to be with you and covering these topics and there'll be a lot more discussion throughout the week. So thank you everyone. And I will turn the, the back over to Breno. Okay, thank you so much for that, Mike. That was really uh, enlightening. And I think this really sets the entire um, uh, week, I think, in focus. It sets the, uh, uh, the big picture of where we will come in. And from uh, here on out, we'll go deeper and deeper into the uh, DHS2 LMIS use case. So to Mike, and as he said, the resources and the recording will be available later. The resources are available now, so you can review it if needed. We'll just hand over now to Gassim. Uh, uh, who will present some community uh, resources. Uh, over to you, Gassim. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? And see my screen? Loud yeah. and clear, and we see the screen. Great, thank you, Breno. An amazing presentation, Mike. It's just, uh, really full of the community spirit, and which is what we what, what we see from the participants here in the joining the Academy. I, I'm familiar with many of them and the community practice. And actually in the community post for this uh, Academy announce announcement, we have uh, 12 people who click the link from the, from the post here. And sorry, I hear echo. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, my name is El Ghassam Sherfuddin. I'm the community practice coordinator in the DHS2 community. And um, I'm just pre presenting very shortly and briefly uh, for the community of practice, um, which some of you might already be familiar with. Uh, this is the announcement for the LMIS uh, Academy. And uh, as you can see here, it was posted in the implementation category in supply chain and LMIS with the LMIS tag. Um, and, and so the community, when you join the or visit the community practice site, you'll find several categories um, which are really, really, if you paid attention in Mike's presentation, are like, uh, it's where you can actually be part of that. It's where you can share your stories, where you can connect with people who are in projects around the, around the world and, and supporting global good, uh, global, global good projects as well. And, and uh, also in the announcement category, you'll be, you, you'll be receiving um, announcements from the core team and uh, the new releases, so it's a great chance for you to always be in touch. And for the implementation, I'll get more into that in the next slide, but also you can share your stories or ask about the best practices for how to use DHIS2, how to configure DHIS2, uh, really uh, read about other people's stories and experiences and, and learn from them or discuss, uh, discuss with them. And another category is a support kits category, which, if, for example, if you're facing a technical issue and you want to know how to solve it, um, there are other experts in the community who are very helpful and, and would like to help. And of course, the core team is always present. Uh, and there are a few developer, um, there's a developer category and a bunch of categories that you can check out. But more specifically, for the implementation category, there is a subcategory called supply chain and LMIS, which is congratulations. Um, I bet you've been waiting for this academy, and this is a great chance for you to share, share there, share your ideas, what your uh, use cases are, and how you, what kind of features, um, what kind of features would you like the core team to develop? And in addition to this subcategory, you can see there are a bunch of digital data packages. Here, interoperability um, subcategory, which 
which you'll find some examples of integration or you can suggest your own or if you have questions about that and want to know how to integrate between two different systems um then that's that's a that's at least a, a place to start and raise the issue um also, when you're participating in the HIS2 community of practice, uh, we are always happy to tag uh, on a monthly basis the helpful users, active users, and it's a COP monthly post. You'll be tagged in it, and uh, you're highly encouraged to have that uh, action and participation in the project uh, by being part of the, of, a, of the community. And also just a quick reminder here, there's uh, also subcategories for the connect category, which is like for uh, people of uh, non-English speaker speaking uh, countries, right? Where you can, if you want some more explanation from the docs and they're not translated or you want to translate something, uh, that, that's a place where you can share. And to continue this part uh, of, of engaging in DHIS community, part of it is also, uh, showing the spirit during the academy. So this is why we're sharing the uh, DHIS2 academy badges. And uh, when you're completing, for example, uh, a course, you get you get the, the, the this badge. And then during this academy, we have the super active badge and the super helpful badge, as well as the completion badge. Um, so after completion, you get the badge. And if you're super active in the community, you're asking questions, you uh, helping other users if you're so if you're helpful if you're sh they ask for a link for example and you share be the first to, to share it with them uh sharing resources um so you actually uh, are going to be selected by the instructors and the facilitators uh, and and you'll be granted the badge um sure uh, you know so as soon as possible some of the courses we're still granting badges for them so they're still in progress so if you're expecting to receive a badge uh, hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll get one very soon and um this was a brief presentation but really if you want to learn more about the dhis2 community practice there's a spotlight video and the, on our youtube channel which i'll share, I'll share the link with you from uh, on the zoom and um see you there and uh, then also after the academy, remember, you can always go back to the community practice and continue asking questions and sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Agassim. That was really great. And I hope everybody can connect and be active in the community of practice. Also, uh, after this academy, ask your questions, share your experiences, and um, we'll be happy to engage with you there as well. I think now we have... Uh, uh, group photo um i think alice you know, you know how we can best do this so over to you yes so this is the traditional group photo it's very simple what you will be invited to do so we're going to do it like in two times so the first attempt um you are all invited to take your mobile device and go on the android capture app so it's going to be very fun. You just have to next to your yeah exactly like <laughs> follow Bruno, Bruno's example. This is perfect. So we're going to do one shot with the Android Capture app and another one with just your faces, right? Just a minute. I will let you know when I'm ready to start. Yes, please switch on your camera, everybody, so that I can take the screenshot. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So grab your phone with the Android Capture app. And just smile, right? Okay. I don't see many phones, actually. Please don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's better. Okay, ready? Smile, smile, smile. Yeah. Okay. Let me see how it is. 
Let me do another one quickly. Sorry. Okay, another one on this side. I don't see lots of smiles really, please. <laughs> like you are super happy to be here. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right, thank you for that, Alice. That was great. And thank you to the participants so far. That was really a great introduction and a start. What we'll do now is continue until the break at 1130. And I'll go through the more specific then um, DHS2 LMIS uh, um, uh, approach or methodology. So this is very much building on what uh, Mike began presenting, providing a, this broad picture of how the LMIS uh, approach fits into this broader landscape. So now I will just dig a little bit deeper. Uh, taking on then where he left off to saying, what is it that we're working on now specifically for LMIS within the DHS2 system, all right? And this will also set the stage for the coming uh, uh, days, particularly day two, three, and four, where we'll do a deep dive into each one of these features. So this is the overview, confirming that everybody can see my, my screen and presentation, right? Yes. So then I'll go through the DHS2 and LMIS, the why, why this approach and why we're doing this now. The how, how we propose that this should be done and, and, and best practice that we're, we're promoting. The overview of the uh, specific features that we're, we're then uh, uh, building into the system and what you can actually use. I'll quickly touch on some terminology. And I think this is particularly for those coming into the DHS2 environment, into the HISP and DHS2 environment that don't have previous experience. Just two or three, uh, just a few terms that I think might be useful to keep in mind. And then I'll quickly present the sandbox um, where you can actually already log in and try some of these different uh, configurations and see how this works before we go into them in detail. Now to say that we, are here, you know, George and I specifically working as dedicated resources in the LMIS team at the HISP Center in the University of Oslo due to a collaboration, uh, which is the Stella Center of Excellence based in the University of Basel. And this was thanks to an, uh, a collaboration and uh, uh, between Novartis, University of Oslo, University of Basel, and Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute, where uh, we came together to work on um, a collaborative co-creative ecosystem um, looking to improve uh, availability of medicines to support public health. And this is a very broad partnership where, where we're looking to bring different uh, stakeholders around the table to improve uh, this aspect. And at the University of Oslo, specifically in DHS2, we looked at uh, features that could support that within this software. Quickly then jumping into the why uh, of DHS2 and LMIS. And Mike touched on a lot of these points, but it's looking at the synergy of this existing platform and the system that has been implemented for HMIS management in many different countries. There's an existing uh, um, ownership by these countries that are actually running and maintaining the instances. There's the, the great resources within the HISP network that are actually supporting the implementations. Uh, you have the capacity of the users uh, you have resources within the system that are being uh, used and, and shared. You have users at this last mile level that have access to the um, uh, to the system, have their login credentials, and have uh, knowledge of how to use the system. So what we were looking then to do is to capital, capitalize on all of these existing advantages and then promote a proper good use of stock management practice within uh, the platform. There's a question of cost and implementation, particularly when looking at last mile logistics. Uh, there's a large number of facilities with lower volume uh, uh, transactions where uh, the cost may be uh, nearly prohibitive for implementing an end to end solution. Um, so we're also looking at bringing this uh, um, uh, data, digitizing it and connecting it with the central system, but through uh, a cost effective way through a tool that's already known and used by the country. Uh, and already uh, in the hands of the health workers, uh, as again, Mike mentioned, oftentimes are the same ones doing 
the store management and managing uh, supplies as well as treating patients and doing many other tasks. So this is really adding an additional program, an additional data set to an existing tool that they already have access to and have a, a full support network helping them to, uh, to use that. Um, and that goes into the competence aspect that they do not need to learn or uh, make use of an additional um, a tool with staff turnover uh, uh, that makes it even more important to have an existing um, uh, support network from a central level to provide uh, training for new users, uh, first line support, and ensuring that they're able to access uh, the tool and make it relevant for their day-to-day -day work. We then get into the LMIS landscape, and this is something that uh, uh, we began uh, uh, doing at the beginning of last year. So when George McGuire and I began uh, within uh, the HISP Center in the University of Oslo, we looked at what the existing solutions were and what was available in the market. And there are quite a few solutions. I write many more there, but in a recent uh, workshop we were a part of with UNICEF, they went into the hundreds and even thousands of different solutions that they have found in specific countries all divided by programs and uh, different areas uh, supporting supply chain management. So there are very many solutions available out there. And we were then looking to see what kind of, of gap or need could DHS to fill given that there were so many tools already available. Uh, to quickly mention that there are quite a few implementation challenges uh, uh, that can come up when implementing this kind of solution end to end. Some of these include scalability and sustainability, so the ability to implement it effectively at this last mile level in facilities, uh, also in terms of the costing and HR support. And there's also the additional challenge of having low resource sites, sites with uh, limited power or mobile coverage, and how you would actually digitize a site with those kinds of challenges. And these are things that we learned and what we came to understand uh, with this landscape analysis. Throughout the week, as I mentioned, we'll have some of these partners actually presenting at the end of the day. So you can also pose some of these questions and engage with them and ask and confirm some of these assumptions or findings that we have. Uh, but this is the general uh, um, kind of conclusion that we came to and what we saw as a, an existing landscape with certain challenges, particularly at the last mile, many different solutions of different uh, um, varied features as I write there. So not all of them will necessarily have a warehouse management uh, module integrated or not. So uh, we saw um, many different uh, uh, solutions and this last mile really being an area where DHS2 could come with some value added and improve the quality of the supply chain management and also integrate for the purposes of triangulation of data. So then we get into the how. Um, actually, before we get into the how on the landscape questions, many different, uh, 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 many people ask, once we touch on this question, which ELMIS should I choose? And this is a question which we always uh, uh, give back to the person and say, this should be something that's defined according to your needs, regardless of which one of the platforms we choose, we will do our best and work together with them to integrate and to work together to bring this last mile data into their system. And we have multiple examples and cases and some of them which we'll present during the week on how this can be done. So we don't have any preference. We really work with all of them. We've tried to uh, engage with every single one of these. And uh, uh, we really have a agnostic approach to it where you define your needs and choose your system. And then if it's viable to integrate, we will work with them to find a good solution. Now, moving on to the DHS2 and LMIS, the how. So now quickly to take a step back and, and also uh, 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 Mike, uh, briefly mentioned this, but I think it's important to relate it to, to the stock data that we have three different data models within DHS2 natively. The first being aggregate data. This is the model that we use for LMIS reporting. So if you're providing monthly reports on the amount of stock that you received in a site, the amount of stock that was issued, uh, stock losses, you're um, doing your end of month stock count and, and capturing that data, we use the aggregate then uh, mode, and this is something which we'll get into in the presentation tomorrow. We also have anonymous events. So this is something that we used for uh, logistics specifically for um, uh, one example is acknowledgement of shipment received in an integration, and um, this will be touched on later today. When you have a shipment sent from a, a, a district level or an upper level going to a facility running DHS2, you can use an event to confirm the reception of that uh, of that delivery 
Uh, and then through the integration, the uh, central system, the ELMIS, can uh, automatically populate the, the, the data values for the amount of quantities received, so that doesn't have to do, uh, be done manually. And each one of these receptions can be captured as an event uh, in the event program. And then lastly, lastly we have a uh, track. Tracking. So this is the tracker uh, app, which uh, also Mike uh, mentioned, and this is what we are building a real-time stock program on. So this is the transaction-based stock management tool, which will be able to manage uh, each transaction whenever stock is issued from um, yeah, your, your medical store. Um, and then this data can also be aggregated and used for reports, but here you would have a more real-time solution for having um, you know, what your stock position is at each site once you have this app running using transactional based, uh, uh, transaction based model. We also leverage quite a bit the DHS2 Android capture app. So this is really to focus on facility level uh, uh, LMIS uh, features. Uh, it provides native online offline capability. You have access to the analytics in the same way as you have on the web. You also have all of the data entry uh, uh, capability. And this is really one of the key aspects that we try to leverage for the low resource sites where you might have limited connectivity that you're able to still manage your stock transactions and then synchronize once you have a connection. So this is another key aspect of the implementation. It doesn't, it can be done using a, a laptop or PC, but we really encourage and uh, promote the use of the Android Capture mobile app. Of course, a tablet or, uh, or, or a mobile phone. Um, and then uh, not the least of which the, the HISP partners. So here is a quick rundown of all the different HISP groups and they're the key implementing partners for this approach. I mean, for a lot of the questions and for a lot of the, uh, uh, the methodology that we're promoting, um, we're working on this at the HISP center, but the actual implementation, the country level support, putting this into action is really coming through the HISP groups. And um, if you're new to the uh, community, if you're new to DHS2, then I, I highly recommend that you uh, uh, identify who your local or regional HIS partner is and uh, connect with them and find out more about how you can work together with them. Uh, they'll already likely be working with your HMIS teams. So find out who they are as well, who are the ones that are already using and know the DHS2 uh, system in your country and connect with them. And for us, really, the HISP uh, uh, groups are the, the real experts of the software. Those, they're the ones actually seeing it in action, supporting uh, you know, production uh, uh, instances and really are the ones who have uh, this competence to implement and support the countries. So a note to them that this impl these implementations happen in large part through the HISP groups. Now for the DHS2 LMIS approach, um, we had this landscape analysis. We looked at where we could fit in and add value to the, um, to the existing landscape. How was stock data managed uh, and where were the gaps? And now once we kind of identified this last mile as being an area of need, uh, we looked at also what were existing uh, guidance and documentation, uh, industry standards that we should follow and we should adhere to. And we came to multiple documents, but these are two that we like to highlight. It's the country guidance on selecting an LMIS from Global uh, Fund and Gavi, um, uh, which has a list of some uh, uh, ELMISs which can be, uh, which have already been pre-approved and that you can uh, uh, consider for having as a central solution. Uh, and then also the target software standards for vaccine supply chain information systems from Gavi, which is also uh, endorsed by Global Fund um, uh, for general uh, uh, medicine supply chain. Um, and now these provide a starting point for how we should engage and how we developed a lot of these features, particularly the target software standards. You'll have a very uh, fairly detailed list of features and requirements for then um, uh, an end-to-end -end supply chain uh, ELMIS. And what's important to note, and this is something which we have then published on the website, is we look to fulfill a lot of the features for this last mile, uh, having stock data available, uh, uh, sharing this data with the, um, uh, the central ELMIS, making sure it's available for decision making, informing things such as demand planning and forecast, forecasting and demand planning. Also, the ability to connect stock data with health data. So this is already... Uh, in DHS2, it's in, in principle uh, 
you know, a, a given once you're using DHS2 for stock data. So we meet a lot of these requirements. And for where we see that the system does not meet these requirements, we look at the integration approach to then fulfill those central needs. To quickly list those, then it's having the end-to-end -end visibility where we focus on the last mile within DHS2. It's having this availability of real-time data and that we meet with the transaction-based app. So having the transactional and event-driven system, but also being able to provide aggregate-based reporting, uh, which we, we do that. The interoperability with HIS, as I mentioned, having it in DHS2, you already have that data available. And then cold chain monitoring, temperature monitoring, and some additional features, which we are also working on. So given this uh, starting point on the landscape and then these requirements, we came up with an approach where we look at the end-to-end -end supply chain uh, nationally from left being at a central level to the right being a facility level as having a central system, the, what referred to as the upstream LMIS, providing your full scale supply chain management. And then at level as uh, preferably using a, a mobile app to do your stock management, either report-based or transaction-based, having these cold chain management um, temperature chain equipment uh, insurance uh, of those in one of the sessions using GS1 uh, data matrix capability, having the performance management dashboard. So the ability to also have analytics indicators available to that health worker or that storekeeper who's collecting the data at the last mile, that they're also able to uh, access data and see uh, that data in action and even make decisions rather than simply inputting feedback loops to their work to actually inform uh, what they're doing. So this is another key aspect. And then finally, a simple product catalog, which allows them to see what items they have available with any key information uh, for their facility. Really? Uh, interoperability and integration. Yes. It's breaking off. Sorry. There now? Is it fine? Um, just let me know. I'll, I'll continue, and then let me know if the if the connection is not good. Yeah, it seems there better now. now. Yeah. Okay. So then I'll quickly give you a snapshot of the interoperability approach. Um, and this is something that is built into DHS2 at its core. Um, and again, uh, Austin, who will be presenting after the break, will go into more details and uh, he'll have the technical, technical expertise to really explain that. But uh, on a very high level, uh, if we're looking at the uh, um, a very uh, generic uh, structure within a national health system, if you have your health information pillar on the right using DHS2 for both uh, data collection, analysis, uh, storage, and analysis, we foresee DHS2 only being used at this last mile level. We're not looking to provide an end-to-end -end solution. We're not looking to provide you know, a warehouse management system within DHS2. We're not looking to provide order management. We want to have this and promote having a central dedicated tool in ELMIS or ERP, depending what the needs in the country are, the scope and scale, that you have this dedicated uh, specialized software and then you have an integration either system to system or through a, uh, an interoperability layer, depending on what the context is in the country you're, you're, you're working, that um, the data then from facilities are connected to the central tool. I think one key aspect and something which then to connect to a Thursday session, so the session on performance management framework, um, what we're really looking to do is provide data from consumption level and the importance of having this consumption level data for forecasting and demand planning. Uh, oftentimes, um, orders are made or assumptions are made on, on forecast based on what was previously shipped rather than looking at what was actually consumed. So then having this data available for that decision making for that forecasting is one of the key aspects. Uh, the ability to connect this to even advanced uh, uh, tools and even more advanced systems, um, uh, providing a, you know machine learning or AI to inform uh, you know this whole forecasting uh, um, uh, challenge is a key aspect that we'd like to uh, to ensure that's possible. But first, you need the data to be available, 
And a lot of the challenges that we see is having a paper-based system, which may be fine. It may be a slow process to actually making that data uh, usable, available for decision-making is a long process. It may be months uh, before that that's uh, actually available for the decision-makers at a higher level. So the digitization and making data, data readily available is a key aspect. At the same time, what we're saying here and uh, partly implied, but, but we should be explicit about it is, uh, again, do not use DHS2 as an end-to-end -end solution. That's not what we're proposing. And that's not what the system is best suited for. There is a limitation to what you can get out of the system. And this is, again, why we're promoting this and really trying to cooperate and, and uh, communicate this well to partners, donors, and to all of the ELMIS and ERP vendors that we're looking to fill a gap. And this is a choice that we promote that countries make for themselves to see what is the best solution. But if it is that you have this opportunity to digitize facilities with DHS2, that we're there to cooperate then with the vendors that you choose. Again, just a quick snapshot and uh, shown in a different way that you have your central warehouse, your regional district warehouses running uh, a dedicated DLMIS, and then you have your health worker, uh, community health worker, health center, or hospital using DHS2 mobile, and then connecting that data uh, to complete this end to end supply chain management. One thing which should be and can be identified at the time uh, of uh, not implementation, but uh, project planning is where do you set this line? Where do you set the limit of how far down the supply chain do you implement your ELMIS? And where is it more beneficial to have DHS2 in you know many sites with lower volume? Uh, I think that's a key aspect of an implementation is in the assessment phase to identify what the um, threshold is for implementing one system or the other, where do you get more benefits of having uh, you know, the, the open source uh, uh, solution and the DHS2 solution, where do you have more benefit using a dedicated tool uh, for the supply chain management? This is something we can also touch on and we'll discuss in morning of day five on Friday, where we talk about uh, uh, assessment and project planning and implementation. Now, quickly moving on to the features, and again, this will just be a snapshot because each one of these will be a detailed session uh, uh, led by George McGuire, where he'll demo and show the configuration for each of these. But first, it's the report-based report stock management using the aggregate data model. So this is really providing very clear guidance and best practice for using DHIS2 uh, for collecting stock data. So reporting generally on a monthly basis, but that can be customized. We're looking, it is optimized for, for, we're looking to optimize it for mobile devices and really promote that approach to digitize the first data mile. So the last uh, uh, mile of service delivery, uh, um, as George likes to refer to it, the first data mile. Um, and then we're also coming with fairly clear recommendations and best practice for how to configure DHS2 for this purpose, keeping in mind that we're looking to integrate with the central ELMIS. Uh, DHS2 being a, a generic platform for uh, data capture, storage, and analysis, there are different ways of configuring it to capture your stock data. However, not every one of those ways will be best suited or most adequate for stocks. It may be easier or it may be more convenient, but we're, what we're looking to do is really promote a best practice, and that's what we'll go into why we should use, for example, data elements to uh, map to your, to your specific products or items. Secondly, transaction-based stock management. So this is a tool that we're developing. In the presentation, you'll see also a link to a mock-up of how this will look once it's integrated into DHS2. It's part of a, 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 a informal co cooperation with, a, with another organization which developed this tool and is already implementing uh, to manage uh, transaction-based, uh, uh, to do transaction-based stock management. Uh, and this will provide this real-time availability of data uh, as it will have uh, each transaction uh, um, uh, captured in the app. Going on, we have cold chain equipment inventory management or biomedical equipment uh, lifecycle management. Uh, now, this is uh, native features within DHIS2 Tracker, where we um, manage an uh, item or a piece of equipment from the moment it's installed at a site. All of the different uh, uh, management cycles that might be relevant for that uh, piece of equipment, and these can be uh, configured as needed, uh, all the way down to the end of life. Uh, and this is something, again, that we're working together with different partners to promote and to have a um, 
uh, broad uh, acceptance that uh, as an option for managing cold chain equipment where a lot of this is managed through either paper-based Excel, the data is in different places and you don't have data readily available for decision-making. So again, it's part of providing this last mile tools for now equipment management. Remote temperature monitoring. Um, now we have an MVP with uh, this specific uh, Blue Maestro temperature monitoring uh, sensor, uh, connecting it directly to the DHS2 app. So we're looking to use a, a Bluetooth connection and not going through the proprietary software, trying to not be dependent on a sub subscription model, um, but rather making tools that uh, also can be cost effective and implemented at scale. Um, this will then capture temperature from uh, um, cold chain equipment, transfer to the Android app, and then synchronize that with the server. The two main use cases or two main purposes being for alarms, if there's a temperature excursion, and then for analytics to analyze the performance of the equipment. And again, we'll go into more detail on that on our session on Wednesday. GS1 data matrix, something that we recently built into the platform, the ability to parse the GS1 codes and all of the different uh, program identifiers. Uh, there are multiple possible um, uh, applications of this, and we're still exploring how it can be best used, but this is something which we'll again elaborate on Thursday as well. Product catalog, so having some basic data to the end user for the items that they have available um, in their facility and providing relevant information uh, uh, for the end user. And then last but not least, it's the integrated dashboards on web or mobile. And I think um, one key aspect here is this uh, ability to have the data available for decision making, having it available for uh, district level managers and other managers that are monitoring various sites, being able to set feedback loops where if they have different uh, um, uh, information that they want to then communicate to a facility, facility level user, uh, they can use tools within DHIS2 to comment on the different charts or indicators and have follow-up to make that data actionable. Um, um, also, another aspect is having the user at the facility inputting the data and then within the same uh, platform within the, the DHS2 capture app, being able to see this data, being able to engage with it, being able to have some actionable uh, outcome of the data that they're reporting and not simply punching in data because they have to punch in data and making that a bit more uh, um, uh, relevant to their work and connecting it. Um, when it comes to the integration also of um, the LMIS and DHS2, another key aspect is triangulation of data. So then it may be the case that some uh, data from the LMIS is being sent to DHS2 for the purpose of analysis and triangulation. So here you have um, an example of having a, of showing a doses uh, that have been administered and the amount of stock that has been issued. Um, and you can also have your wastage rates if you're talking about vaccines and making sure that that's within acceptable ranges. So this, these are examples of having integration for the purpose of analytics and then not simply the improvement of supply chain management and improving uh, the availability of medicines, but also uh, the quality of the, of the um, health program. Quickly in DHS2 terminology, now there's the aggregate data and there's an example and I have a link to the glossary at the bottom. So if you go into the presentation, you can go in and look at that, but I just want to quickly really uh, confirm that everybody understands this, that you have aggregate refers to report-based data. So monthly reporting on stock issued, stock received, and so on. So this is manual input of data in an aggregate form. And then tracker is the application that's collecting longitudinal data. So you have a tracked entity, which may be a product, uh, a, a drug, or a piece of equipment. And then you have different events that are happening uh, connected to that uh, to that device, and you have then data that's not anonymous but connected to that specific item. You have your data elements, which is the fundamental uh, uh, building block of DHS2, as it says, and this is what we then map to the specific drugs or vaccines in the aggregate model or in the um, uh, the tracker model. So this is really how uh, we promote the best practice then for configuring that you have. Uh, this item being mapped as a data element, which then connects to metadata, which is then the logistics data, which is applied to that, uh, um, uh, that drug or, or item. So this would be, for example, your stock received, your stock distributed, 
losses or your stock on hand. So this is the metadata connected to that uh, paracetamol 500 milligram, for example. We'll see examples of this and how it's configured, how it's used and then configured in detail in tomorrow's session. Lastly, you have the Android mobile app, which is called Capture. Once you go into the Play Store to download that, you'll see DHS2 Capture on the left. And on the right, you also have the Capture web app. So once you go into the uh, uh, sandbox, which I'll show immediately after here, you'll see the Capture app. And this is where you can access the different uh, programs, for example, the biomedical equipment management. They're both referred to as Capture, just to ensure that you know the difference between the two. It's something that confused me as well in the beginning. And now quickly the sandbox, and I can leave this up during the break. I see that we have just two minutes to go, and then, um, but I'll leave this up so you can uh, connect to it and you can log in. So this is pretty much a, um, a demo site where you can log in and test these different configurations, which we've presented here. Again, if you have many questions, perhaps wait a little bit until tomorrow specific to them because George will be presenting them in detail and going through the configuration. If you have more general questions, well, we're happy to take them, but just remember that we'll have uh, specific sessions there, but you can go to this site and already log in and you'll see all of these different uh, uh, programs. And I'll just switch my screen here. Just let me know if you can see it. Yes, we can. Great, all right. So here we're on the, the sandbox. The user is demo, it says at the bottom, and the password stock one, two, three, exclamation mark. Then you're logged into your landing page then for uh, DHS2. You have immediately some dashboards available. A lot of these are empty. We just have you know data that you can input and uh, it's reset at the end of each day. So you really can't break anything here. So feel free to, to click and change anything you see as you're learning and testing the system. At the end of each day, the database will be reset and it'll start from scratch the following day. You have different dashboards that you can click on. And again, more will be um, uh, configured over time. One key thing, as I mentioned, capture, you go into the apps um, uh, icon here at the top right. You can go into data entry. The data entry app allows you to choose on the left from the organizational unit. You can go down to the lowest level. So the Mahasot uh, Health Center, you choose a data set that you want to report on. So for example, your monthly stock report data recording, you select your reporting period. And then from the different tabs, you have different groups of items, which you can then report on your stock received, stock distributed, and so on. I'm going through quickly, but remember this, the recording will be on YouTube and you can review that and just pause at each point. You also have the capture app, where you can go into capture and you see the biomedical equipment lifecycle management. This is the same as the cold chain equipment inventory management. Um, uh, the same model, of course, the different stages can be configured. So it's just to show that as an example, you then choose your organizational unit that you're reporting for. Again, we'll go to Mahasot. Um, we'll go to our oxygen concentrator here. And then you will have different stages which you can report on for this device. All right. So I think I will stop here. We're one minute over. We'll take a 15 minute break and then we'll be back at 11.45 to start on the session on integration with Austin McGee. All right, thank you everyone. And see you back here in 15 minutes. Exactly. Thank you for that recording, Alice. Uh, welcome back everyone. Um, so we're just past, uh, uh, um, 15 minute break. So then we'll head into the LMIS and integration session. Uh, just as a quick intro to this session, it may get technical. And there are two reasons for that. First, uh, Austin McGee, uh, he's our deputy tech lead. He is very smart. He, <laughs> he has a lot of competence and knowledge to share. And then the subject matter itself will be, uh, uh, it's technical in its nature. So I think what we try to do for this session, since it's an integral part of the approach, is that Austin will go through quite a few different topics. He'll give you uh, insights into each one of these topics. Of course, come with your questions and we can take some of those up either in chat and if we have time orally. But this is rather a broad introduction to topics that will be relevant. And then also that you'll need some technical persons working with you on this aspect. It's not something that you will do on your own or you know, completely independently as an LMIS team, but rather that you'll be given some of the 
um, you know, intros to, to topics which you should consider. Some of this will also be mentioned again in the Friday morning session on uh, assessment and implementation, but specific to integration, uh, Austin will also mention some of those aspects. So without further ado, over to Austin McGee. The floor is yours. Thanks, Brenna. Um, uh, I haven't been called smart uh, as an introduction before, so I appreciate that one. <laughs> um, I've also been told that I brought by Brenna that I have to make jokes throughout this whole presentation, so I'm going to do my best. Um, I, no promises about the jokes. Um, but I will also uh, will try and, and try to make some promises about keeping this very high level. So there are there is a lot of technical detail that we can go into for each of the um, different aspects of integration that we'll cover today. Um, this will be a very high level overview of some of the considerations that you need to take into account, some of the terminology that you might hear um, when dealing with integrations with, with LMIS systems and with DHIS2. Um, but it won't go into any of those details. So to get into those details, we do have a, a whole in, uh, interoperability team um, who are willing to uh, available to answer the, some of those questions as you dive into the details of, of building some of these um, uh, integrations, uh, as well as the, the LMIS team for, for the, the, the parts that are specific to um, building a, an integration in the LMIS space. So as Breno said, my name is Austin McGee. I'm the deputy tech lead for DHIS2, so I oversee a lot of the um, extensibility and uh, kind of architecture of the software that is DHIS2. And a, a small part of that, but a, a big part in, in the DHIS2 world in general is integrations and interoperability with external systems. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. Um, in specific, specifically, what we'll cover uh, is in three broad uh, kind of um, uh, sections. The first one is just going over some some fundamental terminology and 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 uh, an overview of things that need to be think thought about uh, when doing these integration projects. And the second will be uh, some of the considerations that are, are important to keep in mind as you're designing those projects and designing uh, an end-to-end uh, -end LMIS system um, that includes both the, the um, uh, facility level supply chain management, their supply management, but also, or stock management, sorry, but also the upstream uh, LMIS and, and supply chain management uh, system. And then third, we'll talk about some, some patterns that we see uh, and we recommend in the integration space. So how to actually design these uh, integrations between two different systems so that they uh, are reliable and timely and, and have different trade-offs based on the, the design that you choose. Um, so we'll talk about these three different categories, three different sections um, over the next uh, roughly hour or so. But before we get into that, let's talk about why why we have a section uh, a presentation on integration in in this academy. Um, I'm going to to steal Breno's slide here, um, which is the the overview of where DHS2 sits um, in the LMIS space. Um, and you'll see that interoperability integration is a big part of this this um, uh, diagram because. DHS2 can serve um, the needs of the, the people that are at a facility that are delivering health services, have their stock on hand of a particular type of drug and, and putting uh, supply chain information in front of them makes a lot of sense. Um, but that needs to then, that information then needs to flow back to an upstream system that is managing the stock for an entire country, for example. Um, and Likewise, the, the information from that upstream system, that national full-scale EL, ELMIS in this, in this diagram, needs to flow back down to DHIS2 when a new shipment is coming to a facility or when uh, there's a, for example, there's a, um, uh, a shortage of a particular type of drug or those types of things. There are many different types of information that need to flow between these different systems. So this is why we're talking about uh, integration in this today. Um, and I wanted to pull this slide. Um, the the Menexus team is is uh, actually presenting next, um, uh, I think later today. So you'll hear a lot more about this specific use case um, then. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of what's actually in this diagram, 
But this is an example of a real life uh, integration between DHS2 and an upstream LMIS system that uh, has a, an exchange of information using an API. Um, this is the kind of thing that we're talking about when we talk about an integration. So something happens in one of these systems. Um, you can see the red uh, circles here in, in this diagram. Something happens in those systems. So it might be a user uh, presses a button. It might be some some event happens like a, um, a uh, um, a patient is seen and given a, a particular malaria drug or something like that. And that triggers a sequence of events that sends that information through the, the, the system where that event took place and eventually ends up uh, in the other system uh, and synchronized somehow uh, or triggering an event that happens in that other system. It can get quite complex and every integration project is a little bit different, um, but this is what we're going to talk about, how we can uh, facilitate and how DHS2 is designed to interoperate with other systems in, in this space. This is a much more simple um, diagram of a particular workflow in that um, uh, DHS2 to Medexis um, uh, example. Uh, this could be Medexis, but it doesn't have to be Medexis. It could be any other LMIS system in, in uh, um, yeah, in the space, it could be uh, another system entirely as well. Um, and this one, I'll come back to at the very end, just to show kind of how this demonstrates some of the topics that I'm going to cover uh, in the in the preceding sections. So we won't get into this right now, um, but just to to give an idea of what this is, what this actually is modeling, um, is an event that happens at the facility level which is that a, a health worker or someone at the facility receives a package with a shipment of drugs from the central supply um, depot. Uh, so what then needs to happen is that person who has received that shipment needs to record that that shipment was received. Um, we talked a little bit about um, uh, the ability to do um, scanning of barcodes or GSM one data matrix is, a, is another level of that. And um, so the, the, the person at the facility might scan the label on that shipment that goes into DHS2, it gets recorded as a shipment that has been received, and then that needs to be sent to the upstream system. Um, that could happen immediately, or it could happen uh, maybe once, once per day in the night, it could synchronize all of, the, all of the shipments that have been received across all of the facilities in the, uh, in the country, for example. Um, but eventually it ends up in that upstream system where it can be confirmed that this shipment that was sent out a week ago or two days ago or 12 hours ago or something uh, actually was received at its, at its intended destination and didn't get lost somewhere in transit. So now we have a complete idea of the shipment that was sent out. It's now been received. And now we know that at this facility, there are these um, uh, this this particular drug or this particular product that was sent there is now on hand for for their use. Um, this gives the upstream LMS system an idea, basically a, a, a picture of where everything is in the entire in the entire system, whether that's in warehouse in the in the capital city or it's in a, a facility in a, or a clinic in a rural rural village. So how do we actually make this happen? Um, we saw some the, the pieces of that diagram where there are systems talking together. Um, to, to get into that, we'll talk about what is an API. Um, so an API is what is basically computers use to talk to each other. Um, it's one way for computers to talk to each other. And this may be review for some people, so bear with me if, the, if this is uh, very, very simple for you. Other people maybe have never even heard the term API before, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about just what it means. Um, it stands for Application Programming Interface, and this means it's a way for code or, or, or computer software to um, have an interface to talk to another piece of computer software. Um, this allows one application, which might be DHS2, to talk to another application, such as the upstream LMIS system. Um, typically, uh, a, a, both of these systems will have their own APIs, so they all basically define kind of what operations someone can or another, another piece of software can perform by, or ask that system to perform. 
Um, this is a very high level and it can do a lot of different things, but the basic idea is it's just a way to say, these are the things that you can ask me to do. Uh, and here is how you ask me to do them. Um, that that thing might be update the stock of this particular vaccine, or it might be give me all of the vaccines that you have on hand. Another key kind of fundamental building block of a lot of this um, uh, interoperability work and, and uh, LMIS in general is uh, identifiers and, and code lists. So it's important to think about how you refer to a specific drug or product. It's important to understand who or which system maintains the list of those products. Uh, and it's important to think about how those change changes to that list, which um, when you're first designing a system, you might think, oh, I'm just going to define this once and uh, I'll never need to change it. But then all of a sudden COVID happens and now there's a new vaccine on the market for COVID-19, or maybe there are 10 new vaccines for COVID-19 uh, and you need to add those to your list. And then you need to tell all the other systems that have a list of vaccines to update their list with these new um, these new ones. Or maybe the name changes, or maybe one of those vaccines gets um, uh, um, is disqualified from being used in the future, or or something like that. Um, you need to have a way to share that information with all of the different systems that are taking part in this in this process. Um, and there are um, ways to do this with some uh, some standards, but the important thing is within the architecture of a, a particular health system or a particular LMIS system to have a single source of truth as much as possible for where where that that lives and where every everyone can go to see what is the what is the truth of what what this list of vaccines is. That's all oftentimes difficult in practice and there's a lot of ways you have to um, kind of distribute that list and maybe have some slightly out of date lists sometimes, but you have to be aware of that within your system. And um, we won't get into the details of that too much here today. Um, I would be remiss to have a, a, a presentation on interoperability or integrations um, without mentioning this book, which is kind of the, the, um, uh, the holy grail of, of books when it comes to uh, designing technical interoperability between systems. It's called Enterprise Integration Patterns, uh, and it uh, goes, it's, it's quite technical, but it goes into detail about um, how systems talk to each other and the things that you need to think about when you're, when you're designing those systems uh, and those, the, the connections between those systems. Um, I'll go over some very, very basic uh, patterns here today that um, are, are much more thoroughly documented in, in this book, but that is a, um, uh, something that you can refer to uh, or your technical folks can refer to um, when they're doing these patterns. So here are a couple of just examples from that book. Um, and it's an important, uh, important one here up at the top um, to show that you have two different systems or two different applications, application A and application B. Um, they each have inside of themselves, they each have a structure for how they model the data that, that, that lives within them. So in, in the DHS2 world, you have, um, for example, you have data sets or data elements. Um, but another application, an LMIS system, doesn't know what a data element or a data set is because that's a DHS2 specific thing. So each of those uh, applications has their own uh, structure, which is actually how they store that information in a database. It has its own data types, like a data element or a data set. It has its own representation of that data in, uh, yeah, in, in the user interface and all of these uh, and, and at a technical level as well, how you represent that, um, uh, that information to a user or to someone that's interacting with that system. And then you have a transport layer. So and that, this is the API or the, the, um, uh, the way that that application can talk to other systems. And when it gets to the transport layer, it's talking to another system, that other system then needs to translate it into whatever it understands. So it might be products instead of um, tracked entity instances in a uh, LMIS system. Um, so there needs to be this, these arrows on this diagram here. There needs to be some translations between the data structures, types, and representations in one system Trans being transported to another system where it needs to then be translated back into the representation types and structure that that other system understands. 
Um, so this is just some of the things that um, are, are gone into in much detail in, in the Enterprise Integration Patterns book. Um, you can also Google Enterprise Integration Patterns and you can find quite a lot of um, examples of, of the different patterns that you might use. Um, down at the bottom here are some examples of specific patterns that are important. So you might have um, uh, a mechanism to route messages to different systems based on the type of that message. You might also have uh, or need some some way to translate a message so that it, something that comes out of application A, which might be DHS2, gets translated into something that the upstream LMIS system can understand. Um, because if it says data sets or data elements out of the box, it may be that upstream system doesn't understand it. So you might need a, a translator piece in the middle as well. Um, again, not going to get into the details of this, but it's just something to, to reference as you're looking at building uh, integration patterns and, and particularly um, at the technical level, how, how to actually build those systems. So now we'll talk a little bit about some of the considerations that are important when, when thinking about and designing interoperability between systems. Uh, but before I get into that, Breno, I don't know uh, if you wanted to pause for questions on each of these sections, or do you want me to, to just power through? Yeah, I wonder if there's any questions uh, we can quickly take them, but I think we don't have anything in the chat here that I've seen so far. Again, these points will just be for presenting these topics. We can go more into detail once you have a specific case. Sure. I think we can maybe go on. Austin, I don't see any questions coming up yet. Okay. Yeah. Just let me know if anything comes in. Feel free to stop me. Okay. So, um, First of all, uh, resistance and fault tolerance. So this is very important in a um, in integration situation. So you have a, a technical software system like DHIS2, and you have a technical software system like your your LMIS or ELMIS um, uh, central server. Um, and it's important to expect the best, but plan for the worst. So you might hope that DHS2 will never go down or that the up, upstream system will never go down or that they'll always be able to talk together because there's a, a good network connection. But we know that that's, that, that's not the real world. In, in a lot of cases, um, there, something will go wrong at some point. Maybe it's, maybe it's in six months, maybe it's in three years or five years. Um, there will be something that, that happens. Um, maybe it happens every day, maybe it happens once a month, or maybe it happens every year, maybe it uh, happens just, just once a decade, um, but something could go wrong, and it's important to have in place a system that can tolerate those problems when they happen. So, for example, what happens if one system goes down for an hour? Um, what happens to everything that uh, is supposed to be kind of communicated to that system? So if, the, if an event happens in DHIS2 and the, the upstream LMIS is down at the time that that event happens, um, do we just forget about that event? And, and the, the, when the upstream LMIS system comes back online, it, doesn't, uh, it, it has no knowledge of that event. Do we have to wait and, and send it later? Do we have to have some mechanism to, um, to make sure that we're always synchronized between the states of those two systems? Um, something that's important to think about. What, also, what happens similarly if a message get, gets lost in the network? So we're we're always connected with our phones and our and our computers and everything, uh, and we assume that the internet is is just is just there and, and it always works. But sometimes that's not always the case. So sometimes you have a bad network connect, connection at your uh, facility, or you might have. Um, even uh, a network uh, problem between two data centers um, or uh, Google goes down sometimes. It's very rare, but sometimes you, you can't access Google or you can't access Facebook for, for an hour or something because something goes wrong. Um, so there can be problems that happen in the network. Um, there can be ha problems that happen at the service level um, and it's important to plan for those. And when thinking about these, um, how we deal with these these faults or these um, issues that might crop up. Um, it's important to, to know that there's a trade-off uh, and there's often a trade-off between timeliness and correctness. So in the example I gave before where, where the upstream system was, was offline for one hour, um, is, that, is that a problem in, in your use case? Um, and in some cases it might be, and in other cases it might not. 
So an, another example of a, an integration project with DHS2 um, was uh, in, in DHS2, a, a COVID-19 vaccination event is recorded. And then that gets sent to an external system, which generates a certificate, which then gets sent back to DHS2, presented to the, the healthcare worker who can then print that certificate and give it to the person who's there in the clinic with them. So in that situation, if the upstream system that's generating those certificates goes goes down, then the per, the person who's administering the vaccine can record the event that they administered the vaccine, but they don't have a certificate that they can print and hand to the person right there. Um, so in that case, it might be important that the the upstream system doesn't go down and that there there is a a very fast um, uh, synchronization between the DHS two and that upstream that that certificate generation system. Um, but there might be ways to uh, think about the process from a non-technical level to also say, could we maybe send this certificate to that person by uh, by SMS or by email, or have them come back to the facility later to get their um, their their certificate? Um, so that's something to, important to think about: is how important is timeliness if we're trying to deal with situations where there might be a a, a problem connecting those two systems. Um, and the second part of this is to consider correctness. So um, maybe it's not important that within a minute you get the, the, the data is synchronized between these two systems. Um, maybe it's okay that it waits for a day, but maybe it's very important that the, the synchronization actually happens and that you, you know that um, if I'm looking at, at the end of a day, if I'm looking at the, the LMS system, it has a, a, a true view of everything that's happened during that day at the facility level in the DHS2 systems. Um, so sometimes there's a, there's a little bit of a trade-off there. Um, you can get the best of both worlds, but you need to think about it from an integration perspective of how, how do we actually ensure that we, we get information quickly when we need it, um, but we make sure that we're not missing anything um, and that we don't lose information um, because we're we're optimizing for um, for quick uh, delivery of that of that data. Another very important consideration when working on an integration project is security. So this is something um, uh, that uh, any any project needs to think about. It's always important to think about security, but in an integration project specifically, uh, you have two technical systems that talk to each other. Um, and DHS2 might have a lot of data on individual people, on um, uh, the, the entire healthcare system that maybe shouldn't be accessible from the, the LMIS. So someone who's uh, an operator at the, at the um, uh, supply chain um, warehouse shouldn't necessarily have access to the, the medical record of, of an individual person. Um, and so it's important to think about when you're designing these systems, not only do you restrict the, the, um, uh, the access as much as possible for each of those systems to talk to the other, the other one, but also that you uh, think about it at a technical level for where, where do you actually put the keys to these other systems. Um, so we'll, we'll not get into the details of that too much, but um, you might you might actually be able to design an integration where the the LMIS system doesn't have access at all to DHS2 directly. It's getting that information from a from a, an intermediary, a message broker that actually has the 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 keys to that um, uh, DHS2 system, or that is getting that information in a in a asynchronous way. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but overall, it's important to think about uh, security from uh, a systems perspective. How does one system talk to the other? And how do you restrict as much as possible the access that those systems have to, to each other um, to only what they need and not what they don't need or what they shouldn't have access to? Another consideration is performance. So uh, this is was a big, um, um, as, as Mike mentioned, um, this is something that that uh, 
took took the world kind of by storm um, with with COVID nineteen as well. Um, is that all of a sudden you have millions and millions of people potentially in a DHS two system, uh, and they might all be receiving um, vaccination events uh, at a similar time. Um, so if you have a massive uh, COVID-19 vaccination campaign, you might be processing thousands of events per minute, um, which is uh, quite, a, quite a bit of information and data. Um, and then when you have two systems involved, um, you have to be very conscious of how much data or how many events are happening or do you expect to happen and what happens when that's, that's too much for one of those systems to handle. Um, so when when will the data be processed is another important thing. So, in the previous example, uh, we talked, or in the first uh, consideration, we talked about um, timeliness. So, if if the upstream system needs to respond within one minute, but you have thousands and thousands of events coming in at the same time, maybe that gets overloaded and it takes an hour instead of a minute to get that information um, back to DHS two. Um, so that's one thing to, to think about is, is that okay? Um, can we spread the events out over time? Can we uh, reduce the need for them to be handled in a, in a timely manner um, uh, so that we can process them when there is capacity to do so? Um, this gets back to that fault tolerance as well. So if, if all of a sudden you have 10,000 events that happen in one, in one minute, um, your system should be able to um, even if it can't handle those 10,000 events at that time, should be able to um, recover from that, um, that extra load that it wasn't anticipating. So thinking about designing for predictability, making sure that the, the system uh, uh, responds in an understood, understandable way, uh, and for fault tolerance, so, get, so recovering from issues when they happen. This is a really important one as well. So um, from a non-technical level, um, an integration is only successful if it continues to work reliably. So you can design an integration between two systems that, that uh, looks great on paper, maybe it works in a, in a test environment, but it's only really successful if it's actually supporting a real world use case. So in, in the case of LMIS or supply chain, it, it actually needs to translate to the, the drugs or the products that people need being in the place where they need, where they need to be, um, in the place where they need to be, when they need to have them, uh, and supporting real health outcomes so that the, the person that needs that drug gets access to it. And that's, what's, that's what matters at the end of the day. Um, and in order for that to happen, it needs to continue to work, right? So it can't just... Uh, work in a test environment, and it can't just work for a month or even a year. It needs to continue to function and continue to support those real world processes, because the the health programs are are continuing or are ongoing. And so, with that in mind, it's important when working on these integration projects to make sure that you're thinking about the maintenance, so the long term um, longevity of those projects. Um, how are those going to be funded? How are those, what, what uh, uh, resources do we need to uh, support this integration and make sure that it continues to work over time? Um, it's not hire a developer for a week, have them build something, and then it will work forever. Um, it's making sure that you have people that understand that system, technical people that understand that system, technical people that can adapt to that system as, as the, um, the requirements or the um, DHIS2 or uh, metadata or the, the upstream system change, um, and that can uh, fix, fix issues when they come up. Because in a, in a technical project, there always will be issues that need to be, need to be fixed after the initial development. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, and that ties in also with budget, right? So that that um, is something that you could maybe budget for hiring a developer for one week, um, but if that system breaks uh, six months later and you don't have any money in the budget to, to fix that system, um, that's going to negatively impact health outcomes. So it's important to, to keep in mind that interoperability is, is two different systems that talk to each other, uh, and they need to, uh, you need to put in some work to make sure that they talk uh, together well, 
and that they respect the actual use case needs for timeliness and reliability and um, uh, correctness. Um, and that requires oftentimes some, some investment. Um, so it's important to weigh the, the budget and the costs um, associated with doing an integration project right and using some of those uh, very scalable, very robust integration patterns um, against the, the considerations such as resilience, security, performance, and maintenance that uh, you need to keep in mind, um, but have some costs associated with them. Um, associated with, uh, or related to this also is something that, that George um, mentioned, and maybe he'll, he'll um, bring up again in uh, um, one of the later sessions, but maybe in some cases, it doesn't make sense to automate every single process. Right, so things that happen every day or every minute, probably it makes sense to automate those because then you don't need to uh, have someone that's manually entering that data in the other system or that uh, has, has some uh, potential for errors if they're en entering that data on a daily basis or on an hourly basis, or if you need the information within minutes, then it's, it makes a lot of sense to automate. But if it's a process that happens very rarely, Maybe it's uh, you need to update the list of products that are um, uh, available in your system. Maybe you only need to do that once a year. Um, and if you only need to do that once a year, maybe you have a you have a, a system to import an Excel sheet. Maybe you do that manually, or maybe you you write a, a little script to do that for you. But that maybe isn't something you need to automate end to end to have an integration with an external system to do. Uh, in some cases, that might make sense, depending on the requirements in your in your particular situation. But maybe maybe it doesn't, and that is one way to um, uh, think about um, the the costs and the complexity involved. Is some things you might not need to automate, and then you you need to just put in the effort to do that manually when it's necessary. Another example might be um, uh, recalling a single batch of a particular drug. Maybe that's something that happens very rarely um, and that you can do in a manual way. So by actually just picking up the phone and calling the facility and telling them that they have this particular uh, drug that's that's been recalled. Um, and you can do that in a, in a manual way because you have information in the system. Um, and that that is where the automation to um, show where each shipment from a central warehouse went, where the facilities actually received it, um, what stock they have on hand, all of that information with the automation and the integrations is available in the system. So you can say, all right, I know that this batch of this drug um, needs to be recalled. Um, I can look in the system to see where that batch went, per, for example, if you if you have that, that system set up to actually track batches um, through the system. Um, and then you can pick up the phone and, and, and give that uh, facility a call rather than building an automated workflow just for something that might happen fairly rare, rarely. Okay, um, now we'll get into something that's a, a little bit more technical. It's not, not super technical, but it's some of the patterns that we see in designing these integrations between systems that support um, the considerations that we just talked about. Um, before I get into that, um, it doesn't look like there's any um, questions in the chat, but Breno, do you wanna jump in and if there are any questions? Yeah, uh, the chat is actually closed here. I, I didn't right. catch on that. So the questions are coming in on Slack. So if you have questions, please okay. go to Slack and use the, the questions uh, uh, channel. But I have two for you here if you want to take quickly before you go on, sure. Austin. Uh, yeah. So one from my friend, Nora Stoops in South Africa. Her question is, does this mean that the API works all the time or does it only work when set up to connect? Um, I'm not sure which, which slide particular that was uh, referring to. So Nora, feel free to, um, to, to clarify that. Um, but typically, a, uh, just when we're talking about APIs in general, a system will have an API or, or basically a language that you can use to talk to that system and that will always be available. Um, the API is, when, when, when an API exists, it should be available whenever that system is available. Um, when you actually design the, the interoperability, you might use certain, uh, certain APIs in the different systems to connect to them. And that's maybe what we'll talk a little bit about in the patterns. But uh, let me know if I didn't understand that question correctly. 
and I can try to do it again. I, I didn't understand APIs. Um, uh, <laughs> it was sure. the one where you had those two models next to each other. Um, but I now understand what the API is and what it, uh, what it, yeah, it's that one, the next slide. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, this one. This one. Yes, this one, application A and B. I, yeah. because I'm not technical, these things tend to fly over my head, but I actually was concentrating. And I now understand that they talk to each other all the time. And I didn't understand that before. So I'm sorry I'm being blonde or <laughs> no, geriatric, <laughs> but I'm okay now with it. Thank you. Yeah. No, that's that's actually a very good question. So um, the this this line, the the horizontal arrow here, the between application A and application B, that might happen all the time. It might happen once a day. It it really depends on the use case and 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 some of those um, uh, requirements that we sent. But the API itself, which is just kind of the language that an application speaks, um, that should always be available. So you should always be able to another system should always be able to say i want to get the list of all of the products that are that that are in this yeah the catalog um and then get a response from the server so that's where we get we talk about the api at this level so uh, the client sends a request to the server the client might be one system it might be just me um, I ask the LMIS system, what is, how many, well, give me the list of all the products in your catalog, and it sends me back that list. Um, so that's what an API is, is just kind of that language uh, of, of communication there. And then this, this process of how to, how often do we um, ask the, the system for its updated list of, of um, uh, products. Um, that might happen once a day. It might happen uh, once a minute, depending on on how how are you doing that. So thank you for that question, there. And um, Breno, was there another question as well? Actually, yeah, we have a few more questions. Two are from me, I have to admit, but we have two a bit heavy questions. So Austin, either you may take it up in your coming section, so you can leave it to the mm -hmm. end, or you take them up at the end. So the first is from. Robert Modi, he asks, uh, besides the DHS2 API, are there some examples of existing interoperability tools that are open source or digital public good? So that's the first one kind of broad question. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, uh, from Kose Bilali, what methodology can we consider end-to-end -end API or using a mediator? What use cases best fit any of them? And I think this is, each of these questions can be a, a seminar on their own, but uh, you decide how you want to, how to take them now or at the end. Yeah, we we won't be able to 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 dive into those those completely, but I, I will actually cover both of those in this in this next section. So um, that yeah, uh, hopefully, if if I don't uh, if I don't get to uh, answer that question sufficiently by the end of this next section, um, uh, please feel free to ask those again. Yeah, we'll give them your home number and address. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, you had two questions yourself, Breno, or did you did you? No, go um, ahead. Uh, we can. We can keep those to the end. Just go ahead with the presentation, Austin. Sure. Um, so this is actually very, very much in line with with what uh, what those last two questions were were referring to. Um, here we'll talk about some uh, a little bit more technical kind of patterns for integration between two different systems, and these are fairly generic, so they're not specific to um, uh, LMIS or or DHIS two and LMIS. Um, but the, they are very useful in, in those cases. And we'll get back to the example that we talked about in the beginning um, to show how we use um, some of those systems here. Um, so the first one here is point-to-point -point versus middleware um, in integration between two different systems. So point-to-point -point is as simple as it gets. It means that uh, I'm talking to Breno. Breno has the answer that I want. I just ask Breno, um, what is the, the the list of products in your catalog? And Breno tells me the list of products in his catalog. So that's DHIS2 talking to one other system um, and just talking directly to that system. That's obviously the, the simplest to, to set up, but it can have some challenges with um, a number of, for a number of different reasons. So first of all, um, what happens if Breno isn't available? Um, then, where, where, who do I ask? I can't ask anyone if Breno isn't available. So Breno is the, the server on the right here and I'm DHS too. Um, <laughs> this is my joke, Breno. Um, 
And then the second question is, what happens if Breno needs some more information from me? Um, I need to give him uh, so the keys to my house so that he can come and uh, get some papers or something from me. So I need to give Breno the keys to my house in order to have this exchange work. Um, that's a that's a metaphor for basically the the other system, the other LMIS system needs to be able to uh, access DHS2 directly and to um, have permission to um, to read data from DHS2. So that maybe you don't want that in in all cases. Maybe you want to to have a very um, uh, your your DHS2 system is very secure. It has a lot of personal and identifiable information. You don't want to give anyone the keys to that system. Um, then you might want to avoid this point-to-point -point system. Another situation where it might be disadvantageous or not advantageous to use a point-to-point -point, uh, design is that, um, yeah, is that is a, it might be unreliable. So um, you you need to uh, think about um, what would happen if one system, uh, one of these systems went down. Um, and another consideration is the the longevity or the maintenance of this system over time. So you're you're basically talking, you're designing something that is very specific to these two systems and only these two systems. And if in the future either of those change, you need to change the the integration as well. Um, and if you want to swap out um, to, for a different ELMI system or a different uh, health management system, it becomes much more difficult. So um, that's another disadvantage is that you're very you're you're building something that's very specific to the this this particular communication between DHS2 and one specific external system. So what's the alternative? The alternative is to use an interoperability layer or some kind of middleware between. DHS2 and this external system. So instead of talking directly to each other, there's someone in the middle who can say, all right, I've, I have these questions. Um, this is the example of um, all of you asking questions on Slack right now. Um, Breno is, um, is my middleware. He is my interoperability layer because he is reading all of those questions, um, synthesizing them, maybe, maybe deduplicating them, um, and then he knows that um, he needs to send certain questions to me and maybe certain questions to George in the next session. So he is kind of the broker of figuring out what everybody needs and who can serve those needs. Um, so that's what an interoperability layer does or a middleware does. Um, and there are a number of advantages to a system like this. Um, security is one. So you'll see that the key here is between the, the interoperability layer and DHIS2. Um, which means that the the external system doesn't need to have direct access to DHS2. Um, it needs to get the information that it needs from that broker and um, that middleware, but it doesn't need to have direct access or be able to request information from DHS2 at any time that it wants. Um, the second is scalability. So um, if uh, at some point in the future, there are two or three systems on one side of this diagram, um, that becomes much easier when you have something in the middle, so you don't need to update DHS2 to talk to three systems on the right, or if you have three, even three different DHS2 systems or, or a bunch of different heterogeneous systems that all need to talk to each other, they don't all need to know about everything else that's going on. Um, this is an example of that where you might have uh, DHS2 just talks to, um, so I just talked to Breno and Breno talks to everyone else uh, and gets information about the different questions that are being asked in that example. Um, the third um, advantage here is separation of concerns. So the, uh, the server or the system on the right here doesn't even need to know that, that DHS2 is on the left. Um, it just knows how to talk uh, to this interoperability layer, this middleware, um, and it, it, it doesn't matter whether this is talking to DHS2, this is talking to some other system um, to get information uh, that it needs uh, to answer this question. So this allows the systems to be independent and, and to separate um, themselves. Um, again, this is um, important for scalability as you, you uh, increase the complexity of all the different systems that need to talk to each other, um, as well as uh, if you 
all of a sudden have thousands and thousands of events and you need to have multiple systems uh, processing those events. Um, it becomes easier if you have a, a middleware, but it does require some additional design and some additional thinking to figure out how to how to design that interoperability layer in a in a in a way um, in a way that will scale and that um, is agnostic to the the specifics of the two different systems. So there is a trade off there in terms of the the complexity of a system like this and the amount of time that it takes to um, develop. Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure if it was Robert or um, someone else um, that asked the question, um, but there are a couple examples of uh, open source um, uh, interoperability layers. Um, open HIM is another one that's not on here. It's not exactly a, um, uh, an interoperability layer. That's more of a, um, uh, yeah, basically an audit, audit trail system for, for um, uh, this. Um, but there are some examples. So uh, Apache Camel is not specific to the health space or the LMS space at all. It's a generic software, but that uh, is something that our interoperability team has been working a lot with to produce uh, basically um, uh, workflows um, for when something happens in, in DHIS2 to send that information to different places. Uh, and it has some nice languages for talking to different systems. Um, Open function is another one that's more specific to the health space um, that allows kind of routing of messages to different systems. Um, and they have recently uh, launched an open source version. So, so that is a, a DPG as well. Um, yeah, this is, uh, uh, there, are some other, there are some others out there that you could use uh, at, the, at this interoperability layer. Um, but there are uh, some, some options out there that kind of serve as the basis uh, you still need to do some work in 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 both of the in all of these cases to actually design the workflows that support your use cases, um, but there are some tools that can help you to do that. Um, just put some uh, um, examples down here or some links down here at the bottom. Um, the integration page on the DHS2 website uh, is a good place to go it's for some of that in the links and, and descriptions of the projects that the interoperability team has been working on. Um, and then it, even more specifically, there's some examples um, in, in a GitHub repository um, that show how to do specific, specific workflows in uh, Apache Camel um, that you can use um, if you need to in reference. Um, and additionally, if you are working on a project, particularly with Camel, but in general, uh, you're working on a project to integrate with DHS2, um, please reach out because um, we can support you in, in figuring out what APIs to use and how to how to build those, those systems in a reliable way. So next I'll talk about another um, uh, kind of pattern that we see in interoperability. Um, it's actually two different patterns here. Um, and what the trade-offs are between them or the, the differences are. Um, so the first is polling or polling data. Um, it's a little bit hard to say the, say the difference there, but um, in this case, there is one system that is talking to DHS2 and it, uh, there's no way, in, in this example, there's no way for DHS2 to, um, to tell that system something just happened. So instead, the, the external system or the up to upstream LMIS needs to ask all the time, did something happen? No. Did something happen? No. Did something happen? Yes. And so the DHS2's way of communicating is uh, in the response to a request from this external system. This can work, and this is actually oftentimes the simplest way to set up a, um, uh, an integration project. Um, but uh, it, it's chatty, right? So a lot of times the answer will be no, maybe. Um, and so then you're, you're sending a lot of requests. You're asking a lot, the, the question a lot, are there, uh, is there any new data? Is there any new data? Um, and the answer might be no most of the time. Um, so in that case, it's a little, it can be a little bit wasteful and a little bit um, um, uh, untimely as well. Because if you're only, if you're asking, and you want to, if you want to know when an event happens within a minute, you need to ask, is there a new, is there a new event every minute? And so that can be quite, quite a lot of um, information going back and forth. Um, the alternative to this 
is pushing data. So this is hooks is one mechanism for, for doing this. Um, but this basically lets the, the external system tell DHS to tell me when my data is ready. So when an event happens, tell me. This is, this is how you can find me. This is my address or this is my phone number. Call me when, this ha when something happens. And then you don't have to ask again because you know that DHS2 will tell you when something has happened. Um, and when, when that event happens, you receive a call um, and, that, uh, and you know that that's, um, that information is available. In a lot of, um, this is kind of the, the callback um, uh, uh, approach, right? So sometimes you, you give someone a call, you maybe give them a missed call, and they, uh, then they know that they need to call you when, when something is ready or when, when something is available. Um, and then you don't have to keep calling them every minute or every hour, they will call you when, when it's time. Um, so that's what uh, another way to go about this. Um, this is something that is not uh, um, fully supported in DHS2 yet. So it should be coming in the next version in 240 uh, to have a, 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 a full-fledged webhook support, but it is supported in, in certain uh, cases. So we do support uh, notifications uh, from programs and program stages uh, to SMS and email, and also to um, webhooks. Um, so that's a, a uh, something that we can do uh, with programs uh, stage notifications, specifically something we added for COVID, um, but uh, it will be even more um, supported in in the future in uh, in DHS two two forty. So, what are sort of some of the trade offs between pulling data and pushing data? When you're pulling data, um, a lot of times it's more reliable, right? So. Um, there, you have to you have to think about how you design this. But um, if you're if you're asking, give me all of the events that happened in the last minute, and then you get a response, you know that 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 response should be complete. Um, it should be all of the events that happened in the last minute. Um, and maybe if you miss a minute, you say, give me all of the events that happened in the last two minutes instead of the last one minute, and then the response should still be complete, and you should still get the entire uh, list of all of the events. Um, but it might be less timely because you might not want to ask every minute. Maybe you're asking every hour or every day instead. And so you won't necessarily get, um, when, when an event happens, it might be 24 hours before you actually get that information when you ask for it. Um, so that's a, a disadvantage or, or a trade-off that you have to think about when you're using a poll um, type of integration. The, push type of information is, is a bit the opposite. So it's more timely, meaning that as soon as an event happens, the DHS2 can send a, a, a notification to the, the other system that it happened. That's a good thing. So you, you know that within a minute maybe um, of the um, event happening, it will be sent, um, but it might be less reliable. So if, um, to use the, the, the telephone metaphor again, if I say, hey, give me a call when this is ready, and then you give me a call when that's ready, but I don't pick up the phone, I've missed that notification. And so then I need to, you need to call me back again later, or I need to call you and ask again, kind of what, uh, is, is it ready yet? Um, so it's less reliable if that notification gets missed. Um, which is why we often recommend doing both. So this is kind of an integration pattern where you can get information pushed to you so that you get it as quickly as possible. But if you miss something, you have a mechanism to pull or to ask for all of that data and make sure that you have everything in the system so that this, the synchronization um, is guaranteed to happen eventually, even if one of the systems goes down or if the network fails or something like that. Um, but there's some uh, careful design that needs to, to happen uh, to, to make this possible. Finally, and this is um, one that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, um, there's a concept of, of a message queue um, where uh, instead of um, sending a, a, a message and then um, uh, pushing it to an external system immediately, you might put it into a place where you just have a queue or a line or a list of all of the messages that will need to get sent. And so then if the upstream system is down, um, the 
the queue starts to get longer. And then when it comes back online or comes, comes becomes available again, uh, those messages start to get sent. Um, so this is another maybe example of, of Breno being my, my message queue for the, the questions that are coming in. Because if I'm talking right now, so I can't answer any questions, but you can ask questions on Slack and Breno is, is serving as that queue. So he's saying there's, there's these 10 questions and I'll ask them in order when Austin's done talking. Um, this is another uh, pattern that you can use. Um, you can implement this in the uh, interoperability layer and there are some um, interoperability systems um, like Apache Camel and like uh, Open Function that do this for you. Um, but it's an important thing to think about as well because it improves some of the reliability of the system as a whole. And the last pattern here that I think uh, is important to talk about, and again, uh, this is a not, not really a technical concept, but it's important to think about having one source of truth for any specific type of information. Um, so this might be that um, I know where to go to look up what the product code list is. Um, and it might, there might be a copy of that product code list in every facility, but I know that the, the real one, the, the source of truth, the, the, the official one, uh, I can find by asking the, the upstream LMIS for that product list, for example. Um, so when you're thinking about these interoperability projects and, or integration projects, it's important to think about, um, uh, where where does that data, the canonical, the the, the source data, uh, the source of truth live? Um, and then to refer back to that and make sure that you're synchronizing from that when you're designing these inter uh, integration patterns. So now let's finally, um, and we're wrapping up here, let's get back to this example. Um, so we had this example of uh, the um, receiving a package at a specific facility. Uh, I'm sorry there weren't more examples here. It could have been could have been more uh, kind of contextualized. Um, but in this case, we're 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 seeing in practice, um, and you can you can uh, I won't get into the details, but there there's a kind of a workflow here where the health worker creates a package uh, reception event in DHIS2. Then there's a program notification webhook which is pushing that data out to the upstream LMIS system. Um, in this case, there's no middleware, so there's no interoperability layer, which is, means it makes this a point-to-point -point integration. So DHS2 sends that notification as a push to Medexis. Um, and then also, um, every X hours or every day, uh, the upstream LMIS system will ask DHS2 for all of the, all of the data that, uh, or all of the events that happened in the last X hours or last day. So this is both a push event, but if that push fails for whatever reason, if, if the upstream system is down or the network fails, then every day or every some number of hours, um, it, we can request and pull the data back from DHIS2 and say, give me all of the events that happened in the last day. I wanna make sure that I got them all. If I missed any, I'm gonna update my system to, to reflect that. So we have both push for timeliness and pull for reliability here. Um, and at the end of the day, after that poll, event, uh, poll has happened uh, successfully, the, the information should be synchronized. So DHS2 and the upstream LMS system should both know that the, this package was received at this particular facility. Um, and that, that way we can uh, yeah, keep that, stuff, that information in sync. Um, also important to point out that there are two different sources of truth here. Um, because their they're, they're a source of truth doesn't need to be the same source of truth for everything. It just needs to be the same source of truth for any specific thing. So in this case, the facility supply, so what the facility has on hand is kept in DHS2 because that's where the health worker is uh, looking at the supply where they're um, uh, for when they're trying to give someone uh, a particular drug um, or uh, updating it when they receive a package. Um, but the packages, the, the actual resupply packages that are sent out from a central warehouse, that source of truth is the upstream system or Medexis or the, the ELMIS. Um, so there are two different so sources of truth for different types of information, but the, and the information is kind of duplicated between the two of them, 
but there's always one that is the, the most correct. And we know that that is the most correct for that specific type of information. So this was just an example of uh, interoperability and integration systems and, and some of the patterns that you might see and might need to think about, things that you might need to think about when you're designing those systems with your technical teams. And maybe don't have time for questions, but uh, I think that's about it. Thank you very much, Austin. That was really fantastic. Um, a quick message to all of you. If this went over your heads, that's perfectly fine. A lot of it went over my head as well. I think the important thing is that this is a reference, which we can go back to and refer to when we're actually working with the subject matter. Um, it will be available on YouTube. And this is something that you can then refer to when you're working on the uh, solution architecture. It's what we spent the most amount of time on on the Medexis uh, uh, Mali uh, case, which will be presented after the break now by, by Per Kronslev. So it's what we most spent time on was working out these workflows. How does the functional requirement uh, align with the technical capacity with the contextual then implementation of these servers and, and how that is actually functioning? So again, the expectation was not that you would understand everything uh, in detail, but rather you would have an overall understanding and a reference place for when you're actually dealing with these issues. So I'll be uh, somewhat strict with the time now. It's uh, we're three minutes over. We'll take a break. We can come back three minutes past uh, at the top of the hour. So in 15 minutes, and then we'll start with the presentation on Mali. Uh, I'm not sure if Austin will have time, but if so, he can answer some questions either on Slack or part of the Q&A after Pear's presentation. All right, so 15 minute break and then back with the Mali use case and Medexis ELMIS. Again, big thank you to Austin. Thanks, Ron. Yep, happy to answer questions. Have a good um, Yeah, so we started the recording. Thank you again, Alice. Uh, so Pear will be presenting the Medexis ELMIS. He'll give a general overview of the system. Again, many people ask us, which system do we choose? And we say, you know, choose any or, and every one of them. So we've invited Pear and a few others to present. So this is part of that. And then he'll also present the Mali use case where we've integrated DHS2 uh, and the Medexis ELMIS. And he'll go through that. And we can, of course, take more questions and explain some of the work and the decisions that were made there. It was myself, George McGuire, also Austin McGee, and some others involved in that project. Um, so I'll hand over to Pear, and we can take more questions at the end. And also don't uh, hesitate to ask questions in the Slack channel. Over to you, Pear. OK, thank you. Uh, so uh, I've been asked by Brenner to present two things. Uh, first, uh, the, the software in general. I'll use some slides. I'm not going to start going to demonstration, but I'll use slides to explain what the software can do. And after that, I'll talk about the, the use case. And I'll leave some time after for questions. So I will try to keep this at maximum 25, 30 minutes or something like that. Um, yeah. OK, so now I'll put the PowerPoint on. Yeah. There we go. I think this is going to work. Mm -hmm. And presentation mode would be good. No. Just a minute. Share. No. Yeah, we see your screen now. Uh, yeah, but you don't see it in presentation mode, I think. Here we go. Not yet. That should help. Is it presentation mode? Yes, it is. Yeah, we got it. Uh, so, okay. So, first, I'll go through what this software is and what it can do, um, and a little bit also about iPlus solutions. Yeah, and my name's there, plus an email address. So my name is Pierre Konslow. I am what they call a senior supply chain consultant. So I've been working in this world for quite a while uh, in a number of countries. I think most countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, yes. So I'll go to the background, uh, a little bit on the company, the design of Medexis, a great deal of its features, some talk about implementation, about dashboards, uh, a little bit on the Bruni case study, and then we'll get to the Mali case study. Um, so background. 
Uh, Alpha Solutions, uh, uh, it's a Dutch company, uh, NGO. Uh, we are a major procurement agent for the Global Fund um, upstream. That means buying products for HIV, malaria, and TB, and so on from a, long, a range of countries. Downstream, we do in-country system strengthening. Uh, we work with Burundi, DRC, Mali, and Nigeria. Um, we got training part, uh, the Alpha Academy. We work a great deal on data, and we have this ELMIS component. Um, yes. So what's it about? What do we want to solve? We want to solve. We want to give this real-time visibility in the supply chain, the ability to see what's on stock what's being delivered, um, what's being ordered step by step in the supply chain. Uh, and we are in 2022, and this is still actually a big issue in many countries, because we've got we have paper based systems, lots of places. And um, this is a, this is what we want to solve with this software. So what is Medex? Um, it's not that old. It was created around, started in like 2017. As a, and the thinking has been to kind of start over, use the experience obtained over many years, with various pieces of software, with ways of doing things and create something simple and targeted the health facility and district level. So not, it's not starting from the top, not starting from the medical store going down, this is starting from the basis of how to manage a health facility, how to manage a district. Uh, that's where it starts from. And as I said, uh, 2017. It's cloud-based and it's Android-based. So it's made to be used on phones and of course can be used on a uh, computer also. And it's thought as an end-to-end -end product tracking tool means you can be able to track the products from the center medical store all the way to the health facility. Uh, it has various reporting capabilities and features. It's actually designed around also the vertical programs. That's another part of the thinking that was in it from day one. It must serve the managers of vertical programs, uh, both at national level and at, uh, <laughs> at district level and so on and so forth. It's got these reporting capabilities. It's available as software as a service, meaning that you can have it the way that it's all managed away from you. And it's simply a service you got. You've got multi-user interfaces. Uh, you can do it on the on smartphone or tablet and it's network agnostic. Now, um, it does not change right now, which I do not actually understand. Nope. One moment. Okay, next one. So, which kind of features does it got? Forecasting and demand planning. So, using the history uh, to propose what's the forecasted uh, demand in the future and give an idea of that. And then you can, uh, of course, act, work with it from there. Um, it's got Management of the expiries and batch numbers, lots. You may choose if you want to do by FIFO, first expiry, first out, or by FIFO, uh, first in, first out. That's up to you. Uh, but you can track and manage your batches and your expiry dates. So your picking principles are up to you. Uh, and this is all shown in dashboards. We also have what's called intelligent inventory management. What that means is, again, it's targeted these health facilities and the needs there. So uh, we can track the programs and the donors. So if there's a given donor who wants to know what happened to, to the products which has been sponsored by this donor, then it's made for that. And of course, it's also made for that if you want the Malaria program to know what happens to everything they have. It can be filtered by that and 
we track down to the only malaria, only the malaria bug. Uh, it can manage the observable stock, so how much is on carotene, uh, and you can set inventory levels. That means that you will set uh, you set it by program, you can set it by product, it's up to you. But um, what stock level is your target stock level? Uh, do you want three months of stock at health facilities level? Do you want two months, five months? It all depends, of course, on the infrastructure and the challenges you have. Uh, but you set that level, and then the software will help you calculate how much to replenish based on the stock level you've set. You can design your warehouses, so you can have one or more warehouses at a given health facility or a district, uh, and then you can uh, divide them by bins in the software if you wish to do so. Uh, of course, uh, the more you divide things, the more complicated it gets. And that's not always a good idea, but the option's there. You can set mechanisms for stock rationing, so you avoid to stock out, uh, or so you start rationing. Uh, given you have too little product on the system. So the most important feature is this real-time stock visibility. That obviously depends upon that everybody updates their, uh, the system ongoing. Um, but you can monitor the stock status and the system will also tell if you are approaching stock out. So it starts warning you when you have like less than one stock left in your system, when you have two weeks stock left in the system at a given destination and warns you this is this destination is approaching to the stock out and therefore you should start doing something to replenish. Uh, there's both the, the pull or push fulfillment process. It's a choice you can have. I mean, so you can work with informed push, meaning that, that the system calculate how much to replenish how much to ship to a health facility based on the stock level they should have. Or you can work with a pull system where you let the health facility fill in an order form and then they ask for what they need from the district level or some level of store. Yeah. So, next one. Uh, yes, that's another feature though. Uh, cold chain management or management of cold chain equipment. It's actually both. So. You can set the volume, the physical volume of your freezers and fridges by each health facility in the system. And then the system will not let you send more cold chain vaccines to that facility than there actually is freezer room for. Um, so, if you, and you can use it to calculate your capacity needs. You can calculate, I have so and so many uh, cubic meter of freezer and fridge space, and how much vaccine can I send through the system? Um, you can also manage in it the, uh, the, the, sorry, the equipment maintenance. That means that you will also register the age of the equipment, the type of the equipment, all that, and the, the maintenance status. So you can manage that these and these piece of equipment need replacement, they get too old. Uh, and you can hook, the, hook the, the system up with the RTMDs, the remote temperature monitoring devices, uh, uh, which is in the equipment. So Medexis will then tell that these and these specific freezers in that health facility is having uh, frequent too much temperature, for instance. Uh, so, yeah, so these are the cold chain uh, features to monitor that. Uh, yep. Now, uh, transport management. So another thing, uh, managing the transport. Again, this is this is a simple version because it's made for the facility level, uh, but also the facility and district level. District level, you often have uh, distribution by milk, so-called milk rounds, by fixed routes, uh, you can have that, or you can also have, of course, uh, routes which you improvise from time to time. But you can use this, this one to set routes by health facilities and then monitor that the transportation happens in this route. So you put the, the, the products 
on a truck, it tells it goes on this route, it goes out, the software knows it has gone out on the route. And then when you get the proof of delivery back later, you will then confirm, yes, I got the product actually reached the destination. On DHIS2, uh, we're very happy that we've made, I think it was also mentioned in the earlier um, presentation I saw, but uh, we made quite some effort to get integrated with DHIS2 and we are very keen on that. Uh, so um, we're having a, a two-way integration, meaning that we can get data from DHIS2, uh, I'll get back to the implications of that, and we're going to send data to DHIS2. So both ways, and that has a number of advantages. One is of course that we should, any LMIS data should go most countries to DHIS2 for national dashboards and, and surveillance. But there's also a lot of advantages in getting data from DHIS2 uh, in terms of setting up solutions for the smaller health facilities. We can do budget and credit management, meaning you can set budgets by health facility and then monitor that they only reach that budget when they buy it from the district, for instance. So, next one. Yeah, okay, dashboards. Uh, so uh, we have dashboards, uh, it's a graphical user interface here. So you can see a map of your country, uh, region, what you need, and then it comes out these little dots on um, uh, on what color they have. They're green, they're fine, the red, they're not so fine. Um, and you can, of course, regulate this, but in general, it's of course, obviously, the red ones will places which are going out of stock or overstocking, green ones are dots, which are fine. So the various dashboards, and then you, get, you can set the KPIs down here, stock out durations, percent of stock out, expire rate, so on and so forth. Uh, the KPIs can be swapped depending on what you need. These are just common ones. Let's see, next one, yep. No, that was the same. Here we are. Um, more dashboards, stock levels can be set for a specific program typically. A value. Stockout analysis. Stockout is a big issue, of course, many places. So there are specific analysis for finding the places where there are stockouts. And then you can go like this, that show, this uh, one shows here. You could go put your mouse on a given spot, which has turned orange, for instance. And then you can see, okay, it's that product which is out of stock or going out of stock where uh, this one's then close to be stuck out, right? So you can, so this graphical user interface, you can find things and say, okay, here looks like there's a problem. What is the problem? You put the mouse on it, you click on it, it says, oh, it's that product, this program, so on. So a great deal on this stock out analysis. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, this is basically more of the same. From Burundi, stock out analysis. So there are some specific health facilities. I mean, there are obviously many more health facilities, but this is for the ones which has a problem. Then you can find these ones, do something about it. But the KPI is here to the right. Uh, the shipment uh, calculation, yes, it helps you set the milk rounds, set the distribution pattern, and monitor the shipments that things moved. And that, yeah. That they have, uh, that has been confirmation of the proof of delivery. Let's see, batch recall. Yes, that we can do too. Uh, if you need to find out what happened to a given batch, where did it end up? Uh, and you can search on a specific package, specific shipment, uh, very specific things throughout the software. Now, Let's see, okay, wait a minute, here comes something. Oh, that was too easy, sorry. Yeah, implementation. Uh, so we're quite keen on that this needs to be done with local um, help. 
local ownership, local help. So there are several things on this which are uh, where we we think are very important to emphasize. One is that uh, we will have always a local software company involved in this uh, as far as possible. And so, well, so we get into it from the start, but then we need to, when we leave it, it must be in the hands of local Minister of Health, local software people. Um, this integration of DHIS2 gives us the opportunity to set up solutions at the lower level where we actually do not put our software out there necessarily, but we can use interfaces with DHIS2 um, screens, DHIS2 to user interface, which they very likely anyway already are in. And this saves training, this saves money. Because one of the big issues around these LMIS systems is to maintain them and to train people. <coughs> Sorry, thousands of people. And that's very costly. So if we can use this to, to have only the higher level using it, but lower level use DHS2, that's a good thing. We can do this. Fees is an ongoing issue, and it's one of the big issues around the maintenance of these uh, LMISs. So we've got two ways around this. Uh, one way is the traditional annual license fee, but we also work with a one-off national professional license, meaning that you can get that paid. If that is paid under the project, under the implementation, one-off, and then that's it. And from then on, you do not pay for using it. So next one. That was that on the DEXIS. Now I will switch to um, the presentation on the specific Mali case. And then after that, I think we should take some questions. This is great, Pear. We already have a few questions in the Slack channel, but uh, continue and we can take those up. Well, or maybe, Ben, we should take those now then, or what? What do you think? No, I think you should go ahead with the presentation and we'll take them all at the end. I think that's best. Okay, your choice. Uh, let's see. Uh -huh. no, I, don't. I don't think you are looking at my screen. Is it on the screen? Yeah, it's there now, right? Yeah. So, uh, you can see it now, Breno? It's on the screen? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Good. Yeah. So uh, this looks a bit different, but that's because it's a, this project is a USAID project, and there's a lot of there are formalities around this. So there's also around the design of the PowerPoint. Um, so now that's because we, we had a very concrete case uh, where we have a, we're part of a larger health project in Mali. And in that context has been created a solution integrating D Medexis and DHIS2. Um, so that is what I would like to talk a little bit about now. Um, so there, this is, um, it's a larger health project. Uh, it's called Kenya Sinsiwale. Um, yeah. And it is implemented by Palladium actually, and we are sub component to this. So only one piece out of six important pieces there. Now, the project itself, uh, I will of course not dig into this, but it's, 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 it's touching upon all sorts of aspects around the, the management of the health system there for all the, these health facilities. It's specifically target health facilities and districts. That's the level. Now, the objectives is to strengthen the management, especially related to women and children uh, in a number of ways, including the supply chain. Uh, this one I'll jump because we just had that. Here comes it. Now, let's start. So the big challenge we have is that we could say that these ELMS solutions, they're nothing new to them. 
and they've been there for 15 years. Uh, we've seen them, uh, and it gets boring to tell the whole story. But challenges are any solution has to work for thousands of health workers. These people have limited basic training, and there's a staff turnover. In many places, 30% of the staff turns every year. Uh, so may, these solutions often work technically, but they're complex for users. Um, and the, so this complexity demands training costs and training of many people also because of the turnover. This is an issue. And the ministers of health working on this, they don't have stable budgets for license fees either. So anything that demands an annual payment is a challenge. Now, so in Mali, we worked on dealing with this. Uh, yeah, so therefore these EMS are costly to implement and costly to maintain. But like in Mali, DHIS2 is operated at every health facility and we are there combining, therefore, the HMS and the LMIS. Um, and we have started this now, and we hope to go even further from where we are now. Now, so the current situation in Mali, which I actually think is close to the same as in DRC, is that, uh, well, it's changing right now, actually, because we're implementing, but then, say, a year ago, the situation was, that you had a fully paper-based flow of information, fully paper-based, in terms of the products, procurement. So paper-based ordering from health, health facility to the district level, uh, paper-based ordering between the community health worker and the health facility, and district also managed by and large on paper, and uh, then, then ordering on paper from the center by vessel. So that's all on paper, the product flow. But at the same time, you got DHIS2 implemented as an HMIS, and you're having um, data being entered into screens, DHIS2 screens every month, gathered and shown in the national dashboard, which in Mali is called OSP Sante. So that's the situation. Now, it comes then the concept, what we were doing. So we want to use the existing DHIS2 infrastructure to secure LMIS data directly from health facilities. So we're going to take those screens that even anyway put in and then take that data and use that to work with the supply chain. Uh, and by that, minimize the need for training. So we're going to pull data from DHIS2 into the full LMIS application indexes and generate orders for replenishment. Um, yeah. So, uh, the architecture, well, I will not go very deep, it will take far too long, but it's got the two steps in this. One, the most simple one, is the health, the, the products which are for free, program commodities. There we get the data every month, it goes into Medexis, and we are calculating this replenishment order shipping, shipping it. Then there's a second step, which is the products which are procured by the health facilities. Sorry, SESCOM is a health facility in Mali. Uh, but that, so that's obviously more complicated a bit because the health facility will buy the product, so there's a financial transaction involved, but that is also managed. Right now, we're implementing the phase one. And data will remain to go to the national dashboard. We're not touching the dashboard. It stays. Now, so the perspective, I know this is a busy slide, but the perspective is that this update stays the same for short term. On paper, between community health worker, health facility manages things on paper, but they enter their data into DHIS2, and that data is exchanged with Medexis, and then we can use that to calculate replenishment orders. So that's what we want to, that's what we have set up now and are doing. Longer term, you can of course do more. Longer term, 
we can get the community health workers on mobile phones. So they get the data straight in. Uh, we do a number of things. This is also about development, about, about starting a process, about it, it, it's hopefully not something that's just like this and then stays like this in the next 10 years. It's hopefully a path to a change. Um, so, yeah, I know those were a bit too busy, but where are we now? So we got the integration, it's there. We got the solution anchor with the local partner, it's local HISP that's implementing. And they also maintain th th these things on the local server. And we got agreements with Minister of Health, and local authorities, that's all in place. Uh, we passed this one, so we've done the pilot. We are rolling out now. Um, here comes something interesting to talk about. So one part is the technical thing, figuring it out, programming, all that. Another one is the process. And, and, and the, not to be underestimated. So here are some bullets on this, which I think are uh, real learnings, right? So it doesn't take that long to figure out a possible solution. As it says here, some months. But the dialogue to get moving takes more than a year. And I think that must be respected and must be done. Dialogue, very important. Uh, and Minister of Health Engagement is absolutely essential. And we, uh, I guess we are guilty, like other people also to some, to some extent. So we get very happy with this interesting solution and work with the technical people and all that. But sometimes we forget to talk enough with the stakeholders. And that is an issue. And it must be made, it, it's very important to keep these stakeholders, especially the Minister of Health, informed, engaged, so on and so forth, and use that energy. Uh, working with the University of Oslo, Oslo has been essential for us. Lots of good ideas, lots of nice work together, discussions, learnings. Uh, it's important to put together this technical concept before engaging the stakeholders. So these stakeholders can see and feel, but it's also important to keep them informed. <coughs> and in the work process, I would say there is a risk that for technical people, they find it's more rewarding to spend energy on the technical solution compared to the organizational focus, the, the process part. But both things are very important. Um, yeah. I think that's about it, Breno. Uh, let's see, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Um, questions, answers, now I should get to the Slack channel. So I'll take down the presentation. Is that okay, Breno? Yeah, that'll be great. Thank you so much, Pear. Uh, thank you for that input. So going over the Medexis ELMIS, the software, and then the Mali use case. So this was really great, I think, to share. There are quite a few questions already in the uh, in the channel, and I can just ask them uh, to you now and you can answer directly. But um, it would also be great if you can share with us the presentation so we can share with the participants that they can have access to that. And then um, you also have, you shared your contacts there. So just to share with the participants that you can reach out to pair if you have also questions that we don't take up immediately here. But thanks okay. again for sharing that. And we're still on this, uh, uh, you know, journey with, with Molly and the integration, but things are going well. And um, I think it's the uh, showing the fruits of this, uh, this collaboration. If I quickly go to some questions here directly to you and for Medexis ELMIS first pair, there's one from Gerald Thomas saying our major problem with most of these technologies is internet connectivity and i didn't see anything on medex is talking about data capture through sms channel mm -hmm. uh, if you can say something about that yeah okay so uh yes connectivity is an issue uh but uh i mean the we have one answer which is that the uh, application can work offline but obviously not uh, uh long time. That means that uh, the, the way we've set this up now is that you can work with it on your mobile phone offline, but at some stage you need to get online. Uh, so uh, we have not set this up for now to work through simple uh, SMS capture. I know what you mean. Uh, but for now, you set this up so you can use your mobile phone offline, then you can, which is many places, then you go somewhere 
and then you update. Then it, then it hooks up an update um, once a week or when you're able to. So that's what we can do now in that context. But yes, it's a good issue. I, I think though it should be mentioned, I think in that context, that, that we must remember that if you're talking about the management of the product flow of products the, 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 here, if you're having like, um, if you capture a, a good deal of the sites, all the ones in the cities, you're having a very large part of the product flow. So. I'm not saying the remote ones are not important, but I'm saying that even if you have all the ones where you can capture the information, you're having a very large control of the product flow. So anyway, yeah, can you take the next one, Brandon? Sure. I can take the next question while I do that. I'm just showing the word of the day on the screen. Can anybody, can everybody see that? Yes, it's there. All right, so the word of the day is canteen. I know that's probably been, been the most asked question so far today, so there you have it. Canteen. But uh, the other question, uh, Per, I think it's more, it's a broader question and I think it's very important and I gave a, quite a long answer in the Slack channel. Uh, so then I'll give it to you, but I can comment on it afterwards as well. But the question was from uh, Alex Watila uh, asking, uh, some of the features for facility are overlapping between what Medexis can do and what DHS2 can do. Uh, what can we say to that? So I, I, put, I posted a long answer, a long reply, which I can comment on as well here, but I wanted to just have your thoughts here as well, as you did share some, some of these aspects in your presentation. Um, okay. Well, I would say, first of all, when you do the actually implementations, you, you have to, of course, watch out. I mean, you, you don't want to give the users double work. That's the last thing you want to do. Don't do that. So <laughs> what do you do is, you would take care that a given data only is put in into one of the applications. And if you have an integration of DHIS2, well, you might as well get it from DHIS2. Uh, you definitely don't want it, uh, the users to experience that they have to put the same data in two places. That, that would not be good. But that is fixable. I think that, that can be worked on. I don't know what, maybe what's your comment, Ben, to the same? I had quite a few points, and I think it goes back to one of our first uh, discussions we had, Per. Um, now, this relates to the initial assessment, and for Molly specifically then, um, the data that you were looking to access, the stock data from facilities was already being entered in DHS2. The facilities yes. had devices, users were already set up and using the system. Um, the entire implementation, infrastructure, human capacity, support, was already in place. So the idea of implementing uh, the Medexa system at a level collecting the same data, which was already uh, digitized and readily available was already present. So I think that was one of the, the starting points that I think we had when discussing uh, uh, Mali is, and again, back to your, your first point here, there's no need to develop then a parallel system with a parallel uh, app, maybe device structure to collect the data that's already available there. So I think that was one of the key starting points in the assessment phase is to see what is the value added of using Medexis ELMIS at facility mm -hmm. level versus integrating with the data already being collected by DHS2. I think that was the key starting point. There's a few other things we can also uh, elaborate on and discuss further, but I think that was the the, the main uh, uh, aspect to consider. Another yeah. point that I also mentioned is that if it is a better solution, if given the uh, the requirements that the country has for their solution, that implementing the ELMIS or ERP down to facility, both in terms of cost and sustainability, functionality, and so on, if it is best suited to have that end-to-end -end solution, I mean, by all means, we 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 support that. We're not by any means promoting this as the only option. We're trying to promote a um, solution that is implementable, realistic, sustainable, uh, cost-effective. So there are all these advantages, again, that I mentioned in the beginning in the overview presentation, where we look to maximize the use of DHS2, the existing implementations of DHS2, looking for these uh, synergies, to, to use a buzzword, um, yeah. and then how can we add to this uh, uh, LMIS landscape? We're not proposing this as the only solution. Um, I'll stop there, I think. George, if I saw you, maybe had a comment for this as well. Maybe I lost George. 
Or maybe he's muted. So, yeah, I yep. mean, I, I think it's a unique opportunity. Or maybe George, you there? Yeah, I think while we wait for George's comment, we can um, we can maybe move on to the next question, or he can also reply on Slack. Uh, sure. A specific Medexis question, then, um, Pear. If an entity wishes to install Medexis on a server premise rather than in the cloud, is it possible? Yes, it's possible. Uh, I mean, we know that the ministers of health of various countries they uh, they prefer often to have it on their own machine uh, or their own server. We would, though, uh, say that it's um, more manageable and easier to maintain if it can stay in the cloud. Uh, but yes, it's an option. Uh, but there, there's a number of good reasons actually for having it in the cloud. Uh, it, it, it is easier, substantially easier to maintain this whole thing around management and backup and all lots sorts of things which are a big advantage if it can stay in the cloud. But yes, you can have it on the old server. It's possible. Um, so, we've got Josh back. Yeah, he's got his hand up. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you, George. Okay, yeah. apparently you have to be unmuted by the host every time. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the question about uh, duplicating of data, uh, which is very close to my heart. My clear advice on that is um, to avoid any duplication of data. So, typically we see that despite Medex is keeping an exact record at the batch level of all the stock that is sent, the consignment sent from a warehouse to a facility, that people are spending a lot of time recording the stock receipts at the facility level. So, so my advice is clearly, and that's our, our philosophy, uh, core component of our philosophy is to, at the facility level, to collect only the data that is available only at the facility data at the facility level. And that is a stock on hand, and that is the, st the monthly demand or the consumption because that is not available in Medexis or in any ERP system. But everything else, like the stock that uh, received or the request, everything else, our clear recommendation, as you have seen, Medexis is a sophisticated uh, ELMS uh, system that is made for logistics, keep it there. And this is, by the way, also a recommendation for the analytics, you can have some very simple dashboards I show tomorrow um, directly from the from the stock on hand, from the consumption data in uh, DHIS2. But anything else, we recommend build the dashboard or use a dashboard in Medexis. And we are looking into ways of like mm. maybe pushing scheduled reports to DHIS2. But uh, this is a very uh, real and excellent point. Uh, we really uh, are very keen on uh, trying to duplicate any data. We really want the health workers to focus on providing services and collecting only the essential data that is otherwise not available. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks for that, George. I think that's also related to a point that we had. For another question from it was Guy Akani. I also sent a extensive, a long reply in the uh, in the channel. Why we should not use DHS two for end to end supply chain management? Why do we need an LMIS at all? I think George touched on a few of those points there. We're focusing on this facility level and then relying on a dedicated supply chain management LMIS system. Um, to do all of this more extensive uh, uh, management uh, of the supply. We're really looking to capture essential data at consumption level uh, and not overstressing the DHS2 system with features that it's not uh, built or capable to manage. And I have some of those listed. Um, and we'll get into those also throughout the week. Yeah, I, I think, I guess, in that context, what could be mentioned is that uh, there's several connections people have done quite a lot to try to build things around DHIS2 to, to do this job because DHIS2 is out there. Uh, but it, I think it's been a, it's a general experience that it's it's not made for those transactional things. It's 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 a it's a data gathering tool, right? So so that's uh, yeah, it, it just doesn't have exactly that. 
where if you have a tool that's made for transactional work, but for the supply chain, it can do some other things. So a integration is simply probably a better solution somehow. All right, I have another two questions for you pair here, uh, maybe short answer. One of them is um, minimum requirements for the Medexis application um, and device compatibility. Right. Uh, minimum requirements, okay. So, so it's, 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 it's built for really uh, low resource setting. So you can run it on a, uh, a Android phone, uh, quite totally normal Android phone. No problem. We can do that. Of course, it's the it's what we call the Medexis Lite version. <laughs> there are limits, uh, if nothing else, by the screen and uh, and by the data you want to move. But you can run it on an Android uh, phone, the one used every day by yeah millions of people. Uh, so that's you can say that's a minimal requirement. There's certain advanced stuff if you need that. Then you actually have to have a good functioning laptop. But it's a choice. Both ways goes. You said the other question was. Do I mind? Yeah, George has a comment, but let me just ask a, a quick follow up. Does it also support bring your own device, or do you need to have a device managed by the organization or, or, or agency? No, you bring your own device. Yeah. Okay. You, 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 it's, it's an app. Yeah. That was another question. Over to you, George. You have another comment? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to briefly comment on the question why DHIS2 at the strategic level decided not to build another. End-to-end uh, -end ELMS, and there are several reasons. So one was already indicated or implied. Um, DHIS2 has very specific data model, and it's not built for logistics management information system. It's built as a HMIS system, and um, without, we don't have time for details. But it's not really um, adapted to an LMIS. The second reason is. We would just be reinventing the wheel. There's already excellent systems like M Supply, Medexis, uh, others that are recommended. Uh, Breno has presented the, the guideline. And the third reason is personally, I have worked in Excel. I have worked in an organization spending five years on developing a bespoke system from the scratch. Mm. It's going to take five years realistically. Huge amount of money and developers. You will need a whole team. So mm. why should why should the University of Oslo, the HIST Center, invest in that, where there's already uh, several tools? And maybe a last point, um, uh, I think Priya mentioned that um, people have already tried to develop a DHS tool to make an LMS out of it. I think that um, the complexity of an LMS is totally underestimated. People think it is easy. It is easy just to report stock, but it actually it's really complicated, um, and uh, yeah, it would take a huge, huge effort. So we're definitely not going to go there. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot for that, George. I think a lot of those comments, as you said, some of it was implied in the first two presentations, both by by Mike and myself on the DHS two landscape and the LMIS overview. Uh, I've included quite a few of those in the Slack channel, but feel free to come with these questions again. I think understanding the general approach that we're trying to build something that adds to the landscape, adds to an existing gap, doesn't overlap with other solutions and can be implemented and sustainable. Uh, if you're simply checking off and ticking off the box of features, you know, stock reporting at facilities, short DHS2 LMIS and all of the different uh, uh, tools will check that box. But Again, we're looking to add to a real world implementation scenario. And I think the Mali example is a good example of that uh, as Per has shown. And the discussion that we went into is how can this adapt to this existing context? They're already collecting data in DHS2, the data is there. What is the need to implement a parallel solution to collect something that requires this integration? So it's the question of, again, level of effort for the value added to the supply chain system. All right, I think this is this is good. I don't see any new questions for Medexa specifically. I don't know, Pear, if you have any final words or comments, or else I can um, just give a few final words before we find we end the session. We just have nine minutes to go or so. No, I just want to thank you for the opportunity, and then I'll ask you a question. So, uh, 
I send you the, the PowerPoint or what do I do? I put it on Slack, what do I do? Yeah, you can share with me by email or Slack and we'll we'll upload it to the uh, to the share drive. I'll share you a link to the share drive as well so you have access to all of the different resources. And I think all of the participants you should already have access to that. If you haven't seen it, we have the link in Slack as well. Okay. Yeah, well, I think I, I, I want to also say that I think it's really great you having so many participants. And I, I think there's so much opportunity, so much opportunity in get taking, getting these ELMS out there because the, the just the pure value of the products going down those supply chains is very large. And that, that this is today still not quite under control is not good. And it, there's a huge potential in bringing this uh, in savings, in uh, saving lives, and there's a lot to get there. So yeah, thank you for the initiative. Okay, big thank you to Pear. Thank you for the contributions. And um, we're looking forward, uh, you're more than welcome to join with the other sessions as well. And we'll have this, uh, expert lounge open q a after uh, uh, the full day tomorrow so you're also welcome to join that and then people can connect bilaterally during that session um so just to end for the day um a quick recap we have this presentation on the hmis and his landscape so the the information management landscape in a country where you have the health information and now the logistics data and how that can come together for triangulation for improving both supply chain management and health program management. Um, with DHS2, you have an existing system that's been implemented at scale in uh, up to 69 countries. Uh, and you have that uh, references for that on the website of where it's been used. And then you already have it being used in many different ways to capture stock data. What then, what George and I have uh, uh, really uh, pushed is for using DHS2 in a, in a best case or a best practice way that will support this integration that will maximize the existing DHS2 implementations, does not overuse the system or overstress what it's able to deliver, but rather fills a gap, which is really digitizing last mile data. So the first data mile at facility level. So that's really the intention here is that we provide a solution that adds to the existing landscape in a very practical way. Um, I think it's really, uh, we push for this integration approach and there's a lot of implications and things to consider. It can be complex, but I think we have a good understanding from the start what the objectives are and we have this engagement from the technical teams on what can be achieved, aligning the workflows with the data flows and aligning the different stakeholders. There's a lot that can be gained. The presentation from Pear, I think, highlighted that in Mali, and we have a few other examples that we can also point to. Um, for tomorrow, we'll go more into the pure LMIS stock management in DHS2, so the day will be dedicated really to, to that. Uh, stock reporting, George McGuire will be leading those sessions, providing both uh, a demo and configuration of these different uh, uh, tools uh, using DHS2. Um, you can already go into the sandbox, as I've already mentioned, and, and test some of these things out. Try to use it with your mobile device if possible, and that will really give you an idea of how it is to be in a facility and, and using this tool for, for stock data capture at that level. And then at the end of the day, we'll have M Supply presenting their um, uh, solution, their, their uh, central ELMIS tool. Uh, and what their features include and, and implementation or integration uh, example as well with DHS2. So we'll be looking forward to that. Um, and then at the end of the day, as I mentioned, we'll have a longer uh, um, expert lounge where you can come with your questions, use case, and we'll give some extra time to engage with each of you. Um, one last maybe comment, a general comment to the group. It's been really great to see so many people participating and connected. It's a partly diverse group. So either you have, from what we saw from the registrations, uh, more of an LMIS supply chain background, and then you're maybe new to DHS2, or you have more of a DHS2 background. You've been working with some stock data, but then this whole LMIS thing is partly new. So we're trying to cater to both groups. Uh, you may fall out, out of these two groups. We're trying to cater to either the LMIS or DHS2. So one or another uh, topic may be a bit boring to you when we're repeating things that are, are part of your, uh, you know, your, your area of expertise, but uh, bear with us. We're trying to make sure that there's a global and holistic understanding from all of these groups on how these features can be best implemented to support 
uh, the LMIS landscape and the uh, the information management landscape in your context. All right. So uh, without any more delays, I just want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, thank you for today and welcome back tomorrow at 10 a.m. when we continue uh, on day two of this DHS2 LMIS Academy. Um, if anybody wants to stay connected beyond this time, George and I are available and maybe a few others to take some more questions. So stay connected and, and, uh, and ask your questions. If not